Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the joint meeting between the uh, Gloucester County Board of Supervisors and the Gloucester County School Board. Uh, this is our regular September meeting, and um, I welcome all of you that are here at present and those that are watching on TV. So at this time, we will uh, have the roll call for both the supervisors and the school board. Mr. Bazzani? Here. Mr. Crisco? Here. Mr. Hudson? Here. Mr. James? Here. Mr. Meyer? Here. Mr. Orr? Here. Mr. Weinbarker? Here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome from, on behalf of the school board. Mr. Hutchinson, can you call roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Smith? Here. Mr. Rickard? Here. Ms. Parker? Here. Ms. Hook? Here. Ms. Hensley? Here. Ms. Burak? Here. Okay, um, I've asked uh, the Reverend Smith to uh, ask for the convocation and we'll then follow that with the Pres Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand, please. Let us pray. Father, it's in the name of Jesus, oh God, that we say thank you. Lord, we thank you for this day, God, for this is a day that you've made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we ask you, dear God, to bless each and every person that's here tonight, God. And we pray, Lord, that everything that's said and everything that is done, whatever business is conducted tonight, dear God, that you get the glory, that you're able to get the honor, and that you're able to get the praise. But this is our prayer, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we do not have our September 2nd minutes for approval, so we'll move on to the uh, adoption of the agenda. Gentlemen, are there additions or corrections to the agenda tonight? <clears throat> okay, I have two things. Uh, one for a closed session, talk about property, and uh, an open session that deals with uh, the uh, uh, meeting of our supervisors develop a strategic plan and the, uh, for the uh, future of the county. Uh, I'd like to add those to the agenda, please. Are there any other items that uh, need to be added tonight? Okay, uh, is there a motion to adopt the agenda um, as amended? So moved. Second. Okay, there's been a motion to adopt the uh, agenda as amended and it's been seconded. Is there any discussion? If no other discussion, uh, call the, the roll, please. Mr. Weinbarker? Yes. Mr. Bazzani? Yes. Mr. Crisco? Yes. Mr. Orth? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, now we have uh, one, on my, one item on the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. Okay, there's been a motion. Uh, do we need a roll count on that? Okay, uh, all those in favor of the consent agenda say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, well, that's approved. Okay, we're going to move to the citizen uh, comment period. All those citizens who would like to comment on um, the uh, joint meeting, please come forward. You have five minutes, and please state your name, your magisterial district, please. <clears throat> Getting old for an old man, isn't it? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Chairman of the School Board, members of the boards, Dr. Clemens, Howard Mowry, Gloucester Point. As you begin your discussion on the new Page Middle School, take into consideration all the freebies and their values as you present the financial pages to this project. Have you made your adjustments to the pages of your presentation? Remember, all gifts need to be valued and deducted from your current financial listings. The need to build this school in the most economical way is necessary since we do not know what our political future holds for us concerning the economy. The consolidated transportation facilities do need to have their scope expanded 
upon to uh, ex expanded upon to include the county's public utilities department. This school board needs to reverse their decision about vacating the north end of the Page property for consolidated development. We, the taxpayers, know this acreage will not be developed for years. Proper fencing and landscaping can shield the, can shield the activities that abound in the transportation and utilities arena. The need to impose additional debt and possible land acquisition for public utilities would be a waste of the taxpayer's dollars. Maybe as far as being criminal and not utilizing the people's assets to the greatest economies to scale. Think about it, both boards, and readjust your thinking to save us many tax dollars in the future. Last but not least is the ability to establish a pattern of contract scheduling within the CIP programs on both sides of the house. You have developed long-term schedules, so the ability to place priorities on these enhancements should not be a burden in developing any budget in the future. The ability to develop, advertise, and award can be accomplished in the fiscal year Prior to the fiscal year, the funding is to be appropriated for the projects. There are clauses in the contract world that will provide you with these options. All those contracts that exceed a five to $10 million value may have to be designed and negotiated a few years in advance of funding to accomplish the project. The current methodology is cumbersome and you are always chasing the horse's tail. We can do better. I thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Mary. Uh, next citizen, please. Nathan Brown from the Ware District. I was looking over this uh, proposal for Draper Aiden to do work on developing a new garage site. And I know they proposed they, proposed they would spend charging $2,750 to evaluate the site where the present county garage is. I don't know why that's in there. I don't think you should spend that money. I don't think we should spend any more money on the present county garage. Everybody know it's obsolete, unusable, and needs to be torn down. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Are there any other speakers that would like to comment during the citizen period? I do not see anyone else coming to the podium, so we will close the citizen comment period and uh, thank you again for those citizen comments we will then move to our work session agenda and we will start with item 7a the page middle school mr burak chair and dr clemens superintendent Ms. joanne wright director of budget and finance and uh, dr john hutchinson assistant superintendent for administrative services you're on then thank you dr orth i appreciate it um the uh, discussion the, uh, the first discussion we'll have today is on the Page Middle School and its projected operational cost for the opening in 2015 school year, as well as a construction update on where we're at today. We, we um, provided a, uh, a lot of the detailed information, and it's in your package this evening. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Clements, who's going to go over these details. First of all, let me say good evening to members of the Board of Supervisors members of the Gloucester County School Board and distinguished guests. You can't, it's on. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Try to hold it closer because I think yeah. the audio really, you gotta be almost right to your mouth because uh, in particular for the citizens that are trying to uh, hear this on television, I think this is gonna be really important. Well, again, let me say good evening. And um, as Mr. Burak said, the information that we provided for you previously gives you a breakdown of um, taking a look at numbers as it is associated with projected costs for opening the new middle school. And first, we thought it was um, very important to do a comparisons analysis of when the school was last in operation as it related to the 2010-11 school year and dealing with the staffing numbers compared to what we would project to be in 2016. We all know that numbers are subject to change based on 
um, student enrollment that could go up or down. So we always have to take a look at what those numbers will end up being um, as we look at you know, staffing projections for the upcoming year. But as you can see um, from the descriptors, basically every position that we have and what we would need to have is broken down so you can see what the difference in the staffing projections would look like. Um, for example, one of the things that we currently already have in place this year that we would not need for the upcoming year would be like the hiring of an assistant principal. Because in this year's budget, we have an assistant principal that has already been added for Page Middle School. So there won't be an additional um, cost for that. The media specialist is something that's required. So we tried to break those numbers down in terms of giving you a real cost value of what numbers would be, where we could make subtractions, where we could make additions. You also that would be added um, for grounds and custodian and nurse clerical. Um, Dr. Wagner will provide a little bit of insight also as it relates to the position of fabrication lab supervisor. Because as we open up a new school, we need to take a look at those things that will come to enhance um, you know, services as we move forward, opening a state-of-the-art facility. But in those things initially, you'll see that we have a total estimated cost of $375,000. Dr. Clemens, may I suggest either we get another microphone or maybe we could stay right at the podium, uh, possibly. Maybe this will be better. Yeah. Um, and looking at our numbers um, initially, we came up with a, a staffing cost projection of being roughly at about $375,000 based on an increase of 8.92 positions overall. But if you go down and you look at your estimates, um, in 1011, Page had 66.89 positions. Um, for 1516, we're actually projecting 65.33 positions. So we're still basically in the same ballpark in terms of number of staff that we had back in 1011 for what we'd be projecting for 1516. But then when you look at the additional information as it relates to costs that go beyond that, um, the projected cost for your utilities end up being $113,000. Um, the modular removal is a, a price that we got from ModSpace that talks about what the cost would be for um, breakdown, removal, and return freight um, for those um, units. And remember, you've got two units. You've got an 18-unit um, building, and you have a 15-unit building. And they have different prices that are associate with, associated with that if you were thinking about trying to buy the units outright. But the, the price breakdown on the units for those three things roughly come out to about $300,000, a little bit over. And we calculated then um, a site restoration um, roughly being at about $50,000. So the, the grand expense for that in terms of operating the buildings and getting back to um, having two full six through eight buildings roughly cost about $839,000. Now we also put in there what the potential um, savings could be um, if we got funding from VDEM, which could possibly offset that by $234,000. So we would end up um, with a net price of roughly about $604,000 for the opening of the school um, with the services that we need if we're able to get a reimbursement um, from VDM also. So that kind of gives you the, the initial um, price that we are looking at. And what we'll do is um, I'll have Mr. Hutchinson and Ms. Wright um, give a little bit of breakdown about the utilities and the costs and things of that nature and how we came up with those numbers. And then if there are any questions that you have, then please feel free to open it up for questions at that point in time after you've heard, you know, how we came to the figures that we have come to. So at this point in time, uh, Mr. Hutchinson. Uh, looking at the numbers on the second page, I, uh, you can see the significant difference there in certain areas and it may raise some questions. Um, essentially, everything we do we as per, is a projection to what it's going to cost us to open up the new page. And the published industry standard is about $1.25 a square foot. So uh, that's where if you begin with that, 
it falls into uh, everything else falls in the line with percentages. Uh, for example, uh, when we close page, our operating cost there was about a buck ten a square foot, which is actually above our normal, our, our average. We're we're running about a dollar square foot on efficiencies right now, and that was a result of actual surveys, energy surveys that we had. So we're ahead of the regional norm of what most schools are operating in this area, and. Uh, uh, again, that, that was a, a result of a survey, an energy survey. So uh, with the opening new page, uh, we start with the buck 25, realizing as those of you familiar with the building industry know that the first year is always more expensive for, for an obvious reason that construction is often going on while the building is open, opening, which means the air conditioning is running full blast and the doors are wide open. So, you know, that has a cost associated with it. We experienced that with Pestworth while we finished up the HVAC system up there. Secondly, once you have a system installed, it takes time to develop a balance and and you can understand with a basically run through a full season of a 118,000 square foot building finding the tweaks and the, the corrections over a period of time before that, that number comes down to what we would expect as far as an efficient operations, efficient operating, efficient operation, excuse me. The, um, Percentages really are associated, with, again, with national industry planning norms, because I can't sit here and tell you that it's going to be exactly X number of dollars for electrical, X number of dollars for gas, and X number of dollars for sewer and water. But the industry norm for electrical is considered about 45% of your operating costs, and so at $1.25 a square foot, you can see where we came with that number. Likewise, the, it, the gas is about 30%. Now our gas bills can be a little more expensive because the old page site was built with systems that were added on, added on, added on. And what I'm trying to say is that we needed heat or air conditioning in an area, we'd put a unit on the top of the roof, and oftentimes it was a heat strip unit, electrical, which is totally inefficient, obviously. With this new system, we're running uh, something like a, a water chiller system. So the temperature will be uh, moderated at all times, and no matter what section you are in the building, let's say you're on the uh, west side in the afternoon, the sun's hitting, we'll be able to cool that side, whereas it might be a winter day, and the other side might be uh, a little cool so you have it warm, and it can be done with the same system. And if you recall, um, when we spec'd out this system, it was designed so that it could be a retrofit to a geothermal, since we cannot afford to do that at this time. The system in the future should funding be available or, uh, you know, the uh, technology be desired. It can be switched over to a geothermal type system, of course, which is a you know, very efficient system. The, um, the water and sewer costs are, are directly related to uh, HRSD uh, billing in that uh, it's related to the number of uh, just went out of my head, I'm getting old. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, toilets, water fountains, and those type of things that you have within the building. So the more you have, the more you pay, as far as your base rate goes. <coughs> and then associated with that is, uh, since the time of closing, we've had about a 5% a year increase in our HRSD bill. Plus, we've had, uh, uh, we're projecting somewhere in the 5 to 7% increase for the next year, which of course will be determined shortly. So uh, that, that's, that's the reason for some of the uh, differences you see there and uh, the significance of the new building compared to the old building. And I'll have Ms. <laughs> Wright to come forward at this time to talk about the, the projected utilities again as based on the savings from the three-year modular average and how we came up with some of the um, calculations to kind of bring that whole piece home. Good evening. Uh, in order to come up with an estimate of the savings for closing down the modulars, uh, we have 36 months worth of electrical bills. And so we just uh, calculated an annual average of $28,133 for electrical. The water and sewer is a little more complicated because the modulars are tied in to the Gloucester High School billing. So we took the average of the last three years for Gloucester High School and subtracted the previous year uh, for Gloucester High School from that to get the approximate uh, water and sewer for the modulars. And those two items together came to 5,887. And so uh, the 147,796 estimated utilities were reduced to 113,776 for the estimation of closing the modular units. 
And as I would say, as a, as a recap to that, what you can see in the end as you take a look at it from um, staffing and some of those other entities that we talked about that deal with utilities and modular re removal, um, the, the bigger cost in that whole amount in the end ultimately result from the modular removal and um, you know any type of site restoration which at this point in time comes up to roughly about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you think about then the utilities that come in on top of that you know that's another hundred and thirteen thousand dollars so really you're looking at four hundred and sixty three in that range of that total amount that we are talking about that really are not associated with staffing and different things of that nature um, so that kind of gives you, you know, a, a nutshell of what we're looking at um, as an estimate at this point in time as to what it would be for us to operate um, the buildings um, starting next year with Page and then, of course, Peasley, with both of them being operating as six through eight true middle schools. So at this point in time, we'll, we'll open it up for any questions that you may have. Gentlemen, I'll open the floor to questions. Mr. Bazzani, uh, Mr. Uh, Crisco. Sorry. Yeah, just looking at the rough numbers here, I could see where there was a potential difference of about um, seven, no, yeah, seventy-seven thousand dollars a year, based on running, operating the old Page School versus operating these modulars. But I don't ever remember seeing there be a decline in the budget of that amount from, from you guys not having to operate that school when you're operating the modulars on a one grade level you had a three-year average of twenty eight thousand um, dollars my question is there's there's seventy seven thousand dollars a year that went unaccounted for and not returned back to us as as a uh, in the budget process I know I'm not making myself clear, but you had $105,000 for the last year, I guess, at the old page site. And then we averaged 28000 or maybe, let me go, $33,000. So maybe the difference is only $72,000 that we did not spend in operating Page Middle School. There's a $72,000 difference between operating old Page School versus those trailers. There's a difference of that amount. But it never came back to the budget and was never allotted for anywhere else. And um, I guess the protocol for the night, um, just so that everybody's on the same page, if there are things that happen before my time, um, I probably will have to defer to some of my more versed colleagues, um, and then we'll move forward. So, Ms. Wright. Mr. Crisco, I don't have historical information for the electrical budget back to that date. I certainly can provide, prepare that and provide it for you um, and both boards. Uh, but any amount of money that's unexpended is part of our um, year-end balance. And so there, anything that would have been left um, in the budget, and I'm assuming you're talking about the fiscal year 12, would have been part of our year-end balance. Well, so I don't have that information in front of me. I'll be happy to go back and pull all of the utilities from the 11-12 and look at what the budget was and what the balance was, but I did not come prepared to speak on that, no, that I'll be happy to do that. No, that's, that, that's fine. It's just something as, as we were going through this, it, it started jumping out to me that annually we've spent roughly $33,000 to operate those trailers for utilities. And then over here we had the old page site, and if I'd have thought about this as I was reading the agenda over the weekend, I would have sent you an email requesting this, but it didn't, it didn't come full circle until I was sitting here looking at these numbers again, listening to you guys speak, that there was a difference in there of about, based on your ex, uh, estimates here, of about $70,000, $72,000. So if that information would be, would be very helpful. Okay. I'll be happy to get that for you. And do we, do we have, uh, you do might we also... Have. I'm sorry. Oh, do we have an estimate of uh, the final budget for the school board for this current fiscal year as to what um, is the difference between what was budgeted and what was expended? For, for FY15? 14. 14. Uh, I don't have them with okay, me. Okay, okay. 
Because um, that would I mean, we've closed the year. Right. We've closed the year. Um, the balance has has not been audited, but we have closed our fiscal year. Okay, that that might address Mr. Crisco's question when we really see that, because I understand where you're coming from. Uh, that the difference could be that difference that Mr. Crisco is talking about when you look at the end, year end balance. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bazzani. Just just a couple of questions. Um, Can, can someone explain the, the 183,000 offsite road work, uh, which is eligible for VDOT re revenue? What does that, what does that mean? As far what page? What page? Uh, on page, I'm sorry, 17. That's on the financial. Oh, we're not, we haven't gotten there that part yet. We haven't gotten, 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 gotten there yet. Yeah. I'll hold back my question then. Okay. Okay. So yeah. What, what about uh, the contract schedule? Has that been? No, that's the next item that okay, we'll talk about. You. So. Uh, let's quick. address the questions Sorry. that are specifically regarding the uh, opening of the new uh, school. I think Ms. Mrs. Oh. Hook has something. If I don't have a question, obviously. Oh, We've been through these numbers before, but I wanted to address Mr. Crisco's question as, as best I could. And, and, uh, and of course, a, a year or two of, of that time, I wasn't on the board either. But I, my, my answer is I, I don't think there's going to be a good answer to your question because I know at least since I've on the, been on the board, each year the school division has tried to present a needs-based budget uh, each year as to, as to what the needs of that upcoming year are going to be for the school division. And I think your question somewhat assumes that from year to year that looks exactly the same. And so from one year to the next, everything was exactly the same. And so where was that seventy-seven or $72,000? That's really not the way our budgeting is done. I mean, the next year, perhaps a new foreign language teacher was needed, and so that was added into the budget, and maybe that made up for some of that $72,000. So, you know, to, to look at it from year to year and say everything else should have been stayed the same, and therefore you're missing $72,000, I, I don't think that's a, the way you can look at it and get that answer. Well, I didn't say that we were missing $72,000. My concern was for X amount of years we operated Page Middle School. Unfortunately, and after April of 2011, we stopped operating Page Middle School. And there has been a reduction in the amount of money, and I know that there's going to be some offset that had to go to taking, extending bus routes. It's going to come out of that $72,000. But my concern is there's a difference of about $72,000 to begin with between operating the modular site versus the old page site. And to my recollection, there's never been a discussion about where that $72,000 a year went. And that's my concern. Because it's not just school board money, it's not board of supervisors money, it's taxpayer money. And I think the taxpayers have a right to know what went on, where that money went. And, and with all due respect, I think the best answer you're going to be is, is that our, our budget is an open document. It's an easily uh, read document, and the monies that we were allotted were, were spent pursuant to that document. Again, I don't think there's a, a lump of $72,000 that you're going to be able to, to trace through that. I think you, you look at the budget and, and say, well, you know, this year uh, an extra math teacher was added, and so maybe it went there. But, you know, I think budgets are kind of too fluid to, to trace something that closely. Barber. have a couple questions. Maybe anybody can jump in and answer these. Um, I'm on page 15 and I'm looking at the numbers of students in each school. How many students is the new school uh, rated for? Can anybody answer that? Mr. Hutchinson. We're projecting to open the school approximately 600, 200 dollars, up 200 dollars, 200 students per grade level. Okay. Um, is there a reason that uh, I, I understand it in 14, 15, but 15, 16, they've got 570 in Page and 720 in Peasley? Is that a why are they distributed like that? Is it because of the size of the schools or because of logistics? What is it? That's correct. Peasley is a larger school. Okay. Mr. Hudson. A couple, couple questions. First, shouldn't transportation be reduced 
because we're not going from the lower end of the county up to Peasley? There are many uh, considerations of that in, in speaking with Ms. Lannon. Uh, it looks like it's going to be pretty much a wash because not only will you have you have a, that reduction, that's true, but you'll have students coming out of the um, Hickory Fork area two page perhaps, or you'll have you'll, you'll still have you have students now that are going to um, the eighth grade page that will be uh, going. Some will be going to Peasley. I mean, some eighth graders will be going to Peasley next year. So with the in a Bus routing is not a science in that you can say, okay, I have X number of kids less, that means I have X number less buses. Unfortunately, kids don't live by clumps. I mean, in that you, you if, we, great, if we grow in 100 students, you can't go down this road and pick all 100 students up. They're all like one here, one there. And so just looking at the projections for the upcoming years and how the students are scattered as we look at in uh, the grade level promotions, projecting what, like, for example, what fix uh, in the opening of page year, when students will go from elementary to middle, the disbursement of the kids, we, we can't see any significant difference in the, in the change that's going to result in uh, mileage saving, to be honest. There'll be some savings, hopefully, expected, wanted, but again, it's just not an exact enough science to say we can do that right now. Okay, and one more question. Um, and I know these are just projections for 1516, but from 1011, you've got 1282 students up to 1290, which is an increase. Are we seeing an increase? Because all we've talked about before was a decrease in students. If you look back at the grade levels, uh, we've run a, a kind of a crest of a wave in the, in the fourth and fifth grade, and it's running up that way. And so when the school opens, that crust will be flowing through through the middle school. And then after those two grades, it'll go back down, hopefully, or well, maybe not. Hopefully. But <laughs> We're not hoping that it'll go down. But based on the projections, because uh, well, we all we've looked at over the past few years since we've been here is how the um, population is decreasing the student school-age children. That's true in general. And th there are, if we look at the uh, enrollment uh, reports, there are some grade levels that are higher. For example, last year we had a tremendous growth in our kindergarten program, and that seems to be a way a crest that will flow through for a while. And this might be, it's way too late to ask this question, but what is the population for Peasley and Page going to be, total population, that they can handle? That they can handle? Both, yes. Roughly 15. 15? Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, Mr. Bazzani, Mr. Chair. and then Mr. Crisco. Um, on page 16, are these, are these are these recurring costs? You, you, the, the new estimate for the page, the new page. That's a recurring annual cost going forward. The utility. The utility. The utilities. Again, Mr. Bazzani, as we said, we we're projecting that this first year of opening is going to be a little more a little more expensive. We're, we're looking to improve our efficiencies and operations of systems as time goes on. But again, as with most, built, most buildings and most systems, when they're first mm -hmm. upstart, there, there's a higher cost. So it's hope that those come down. Yes, sir. And, and if I can piggyback on Mr. Crisco's um, questions, um, if, if we can just get a simple reconciliation on, on the, 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 the incremental amounts that, that is different, the $72,000 that's different, there's, there's surely a reconciliation we can do. With all things equal, there should be some kind of accounting for, for that money, if we can get that. We'll work to provide that information um, as best we can for you. And in addition, when we think about the, the numbers in totality, as Mr. Hutchinson said, um, once we get into the operating of the building next year, one of the things that we will be able to provide for you at the end of next year would be all of these operating costs to kind of then see where we are in alignment, um, up or down, because we may find out, you know, what we have projected as a a dollar and 25 per square foot, maybe it was a little bit less than that. Maybe it was a little bit more than that. But I think that in the end, after we get it open and we get it operational and we see what happens with these costs, then um, I'd like to come back um, with the board's permission, of course, to take a look at you know the operating expenses to see where we compare. So then you've got a real good 
idea and a framework of what the actual true value operational cost of the middle school will be. Okay, Mr. Crisco. Um, Mr. Hudson, we were spoke, speaking a minute ago about transportation. I yes, know sir. Mr. Hudson asked if there would be a, a change in that. I was wondering if something that we could ask for would be if there's been a significant increase in the cost of transporting these kids since um, Paige has gone offline. I, I don't have that with me. But no, I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm saying you. if you can provide that at a later date, that would be helpful too. Sure. I agree. Um, and if I may speak to you, you have a question about the, the values, and I know Ms. Ms. Wright can provide you all the specifics you can, but there are a lot of immeasurable costs in that. You know, you think about it, you've got eighth grade students moving to the high school. And then the eighth grade students, that, that modular system is operating off the water system and the sewer system of the high school. Plus, you have many students that are working within the high school or you know, traveling to the high school and taking courses within there. So there's an impact upon the high school system. And then if you look at the Peasley system itself, there's a significant impact in that we increase the enrollment numbers there, almost 100 students. So there are other numbers that, that I, I mean, and again, I respect Ms. Wright. She'll give you every number she can because I know she has them all. But there are a lot of things that I think you can't put a, it'd be hard to put a figure on because they, they flow in, in this particular situation where we had to make a, a quick shift and put students in that modular system, students of Peasley system, the, the transportation. So there's a lot of things that I, I, I mean, I mean, I, as I say, I respect Ms. Wright, but it, it's going to be tough to pick up every nickel and penny that, to make it accountable in that kind of way. And, 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 and every nickel and penny might not be necessary, but just, just getting an understanding of that difference, and I know that it could have been easily absorbed probably, but just being able to, to, to see that would, would be of benefit. Um, and I guess the next, the, the next question I have would be for, for uh, Ms. Wright or someone else, but the po potential VDEM, is that the reimbursement? Is that supposed to help offset the removal of those trailers if it becomes available? Yes, it would be a 67% reimbursement. However, um, for those of you that have experience with VDEM, they will not commit to that in writing. Um, every time that I send a communication to them, I do send to them a list of things that we still have pending that we plan to reimburse, but I cannot get a commitment from them in writing. No, I just wanted to make sure that that's what that's that, was what that was earmarked for. Okay. Eligible for 67% reimbursement. Ms. Hensley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just real quick, with regard to some of the busing with the eighth graders, I think that, that everyone will recall that the first year that there actually was a separate bus kind of pickup for the eighth graders. They didn't ride buses with the high school students. And so originally there was more cost associated with that, getting the sixth and seventh graders up to Peasley, running a whole different schedule for the eighth graders to take them to the high school. But then it became that the, bus, the eighth graders ride the buses with the high school students. And so it has been kind of streamlined since they're all going to the same location, which would then decrease that cost. So again, next year, the eighth graders are going to be split again with the sixth and seventh graders. So they'll be riding the separate buses rather than riding the high school route, which is what they've been doing recently. I, you're right, but that, excuse me. I know, but the eighth grade is going to be on the bus with the sixth and seventh. It's already running, so that's not going to be an increase in cost. I, yes. And I mean, I think the school board did a great job considering what happened in April to get the schools to finish that year. I mean, I don't think that's an issue. I just think we were just trying to figure out where costs are going to be because with the increase in teachers that are required and everything else to open the school, I mean, we've got a huge task of coming up to figure out this budget for the next year in addition to y'all. And that's why we're looking at money right now to figure out where it's going. And that's where I think he was coming from. Uh, Mr. Sorry. And, and I think what Mr. Hutchinson said with regards to the busing is that it's somewhat a wash. I mean, I think the, the, there's a maybe a, an increase of a route or two, but what increased was fuel costs. And that was fluctuating. Now it's down under $3. You know, last year it was up above you know, uh, $4, I was closer to $4. So there's a big fluctuation in there that, that, that moves around. Um, the, this, with respect to the $72,000 that m Mr. Crisco had raised, you know, th there's different things that, that occur that, that 
and like Mrs. Hook indicated, it's a needs-based budget. So we go into each budget looking at what do we got in front of us and what do we need to carry on that, that year. So going into that next year, we didn't have the page school. We had the modular. So we were looking at what the cost would be at that particular time. Just like this upcoming year, there's, there's and, and, and I don't think, I don't remember the, anything in the budget, but we're going to have costs associated with page as they start bringing power online at that, at that facility. Um, for testing purposes, for moving people in prior to the July 1 date. And so th that stuff that's going to be incurred this year, that, that's really part of our utilities and, and that's not a separate line. That's part of this, that we're going to have to absorb and, and, and account for. So I just want to make those points. I think Mrs. Hook. Go ahead, Thanks, Ms. Hook. Just very briefly, I wanted to answer Mr. Um, um, Hudson's question. You had asked about the, the bump that seemed to be at at the middle school, the, the enrollment seemed to be increasing. And I, I brought our 10-day membership report because I thought some of the members might have, have questions about what that looked like. Um, and you're welcome to take a, a look at it after we're, we're finished tonight. But if you look at our fifth, sixth, and seventh, which are going to be our middle schoolers um, for next year when we open up the two middle schools, all of those classes are some of our largest in the school division. They're running about 450. Um, if you look at K through 4, all of those are our smallest uh, classes. They're all under 400. And so this bump has to get through the middle school, and then what's coming behind them is, is smaller than what's going to be in there next year. Hmm. At this, excuse me, at this point, uh, Ms. Hudson, <laughs> thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Um, at this point, what's kindergarten? 376. Mr. Records, and then Mr. Uh, Mr. Pisani. I just have one uh, comment to make, and it's something that we've been thinking about as a school board, um, and that is the 350,000 plus or minus dollars you see here in modular removal and site restoration, restoration. There may be some other alternatives that exist that we are continuing to, to look at. Um, and, and I know it's been a topic of discussion in our last two school board meetings. And since Mr. Lindsay's here, maybe he might be able to answer a question that I've been wondering. And that is with respect to these uh, modular units, um, are we on track right now to, I guess it's from what I understand, enter a negotiation with the folks who own these units with respect to the pr actual price associated with either getting them off, them getting them off the site or secondly, we actually just outright purchasing them. And um, in, in my mind, it's not for reuse for subsequent years. It would be for demolishing ourselves. Because I, something, I, I don't, it seems to me like it might be cheaper for us to purchase them if we could get a good price, demol hire a contractor to demolish them, and do it cheaper than the price that we have shown in this budget. So I don't know if that's something you were work, you've been working on or plan to work on, but I, it seems like that is an alternative that we should explore because it potentially could save us money. Yes, sir. You're, the answer is yes and yes. We just began working on that. Um, and it, literally about an hour and a half ago, we got our first pricing um, uh, piece of information from the contractor. Uh, it was not... I didn't care for it, but um, that, that's my job now to see what I can do from there. Uh, and, and I think that you're exactly right. It, it could be cheaper for us to, to buy them and demolish them ourselves. That, there's an opportunity. But then again, there's other opportunities about can we buy these uh, units and use them. They might be able to use them. I, I know in my past experience of using, uh, working with modular um, uh, classrooms like this, um, most times I've run into the situation where I can buy them cheaply. I'm, I'm not seeing it in this case, but generally because they don't want to take them away. But, you know, I think we still have um, quite a bit of gamesmanship ahead to see what we're going to do. How long do you expect it's going to take to arrive at a point where you'll be able to say it could be X dollars if we were to buy them and demolish them? Do you, do you think that's 30 days, 60 days, I, honestly, longer I just, than that? I, knowing that we literally just got the first piece of information in about an hour ago, I, I probably need to get back with you on that. Um, I, I, just, I just don't know right now. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. We've got Mr. Bazzani, then Mr. Burek, and Mr. Smith. Mr. Bazzani. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just a question for clarification. I'm on page, page, page 15. I'm sorry. You need bifocals. <laughs> 15. 
Um, where, where it says page 14 and 15, 44 heads, versus 15 and 16, 65 heads, that's an increase in the number of teachers you need to, to staff Page Middle School? It's an increase, but not necessarily so much reflected in additional funding. Because you remember, right now, Peasley is operating 6-7, um, and Page is operating 8. So when you go back in terms of the staffing, what you see right now for Page is eighth grade. What you'll see next year for Page with a redistribution of staff will be sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So you're saying it's the bow wave from the, from the elementary school coming into the middle school that would cause that increase in staffing? What, what, has, what demand has changed to go from 44 heads to 65 heads? The student numbers, I mean, the, the, the staffing numbers by grade levels will increase. Think about it right now, we've got eighth grade only for Page. Okay, when that gets redistributed, you'll have sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. So you have two additional grade levels. So we're not necessarily asking you, you know, other than those things that are necessity that we have to have, we have to redistribute the staffing to accommodate sixth, seventh, and eighth at both buildings. And that's where you'll get the increase in numbers um, in terms of your staffing because we are serving now more grade levels. But, but you're, you're, you're instructing sixth and seventh graders in another location. That, that same demand should be the same, is it not? It is. Mr. I think Mr. Burke has a response. I, okay. I, I think what you're doing is the, the 14, 15 numbers mm -hmm. for page, which is 44.41, mm -hmm. is the eighth grade modular units, that's how many staff we have at the eighth grade right now. When we go next year and open up the new page, the, the new page will be sixth, seventh, and eighth. So we're going to move those 44 staff members and pull 20 from Peasley, and we'll okay. get up to 65. Okay. And the only delta so no demand we, has changed. Right. The delta that we'll have is about 8.9. Okay. I understand. Positions. Thank that's you. That's the difference. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Smith, you wanted to say something, then I'll go to Mr. James. Mr. Smith first. Uh, I get, my question could be for Mr. Wright. Yes, in reference to the uh, Mr. Lindsay, the one, in reference to purchasing those uh, modules, if we purchase them, I believe we wouldn't be eligible for the VDEM, would we, Ms. Wright? I'm sorry. If we were to purchase those modules, we wouldn't be eligible for the VDEM? If we were going to purchase them, we're going to purchase and them, demolish them, demolish them we probably would. But okay. if we were going to purchase them for other purposes, I would say no. Okay. But if we were going to demolish them, we would be. Okay, Ms. Mr. Thanks James. Okay. Mr. James, you have your the floor here. Mr. Chairman, I think my question is for Mr. Burak. He was saying that we would only have the teachers who are teaching in the uh, in the modulus now when we finish the new school, uh, and they are only teaching eighth graders now. But when the, wait a minute, I'm not finished yet. When, uh, when they come down from Page to the new school, then the teachers are going to come down to the new school as well. So the teachers now that are teaching the sixth and seventh graders up at Peasley are, now, are going to be teaching the new uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at the new Page school. Now you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. You're absolutely correct. Those are the numbers that are at the page schools specifically today, that 44. There's going to be staffing. Those 44 will move over to the new page. Not exactly the same 44, but that's being determined now. And additional staff from, the exist from Peasley that are there today to staff the new page school to bring it up to about 65 teachers. But what we need, what the delta is, is about 8.9 positions as detailed out on page 15. That's the only difference is when we open up the two schools, we'll need eight additional ones because now you don't have this, the sixth and seventh are all together. So when you split those two grades, there's going to be some additional needs because you're going to have six, you're going to have two separate schools for sixth and seventh. Well, it's going to have. And if I could provide some clarity on that also, if you take a look at the numbers that we provided for you, and we kind of highlighted some things in red and in blue, um, at the end, um, you can see where we have the numbers for Page being 479 and Peasley being 827. 
those were the projections for this upcoming year. So you can see that um, is almost a 400 kid difference mm -hmm. because Page is only operating as an eighth grade building. But if you go back to 1011, you see that the numbers for Page were 569 and the numbers for Peasley were 713, um, which almost give you maybe 150 kid difference, somewhere around that number without me being exact. Well, you're going back to that same model in 1516. Page is going to go up but Peasley is going to reduce because of the sixth and seventh grade going back to Page. So your 800 plus numbers are going to reduce back down at Peasley to back in the 700s. And your 400 number for Page is going to increase back up to the five some plus. So you're not really adding additional staffing because you are switching based on grade level assignments to offset the staffing at both buildings. But, oh, yes, Mr. Bazzani. Marginally, marginally, you're adding 8.92 additional new hires to, to uh, satisfy the demand at the new paid school. Right, but if you take a look at those 8.92 hires, some of those are like grounds. You know, you've got a building that's going to be almost 23,000 square feet larger than the old page site. You're talking about custodial staff. You're talking about a media specialist that you have to have. You know, there are certain things that are in there that I think are, you know, routine required type of things that are there. Um, as we think about the school as we move forward too, um, and we're trying to be as frugal as we possibly can, even as it relates to staffing. But one of the things that I um, probably can assure you on, this is gonna probably be a model school for the Commonwealth to look at as it relates to middle schools something that Gloucester is going to be very proud of at that point in time when it's up and running. And I know there's been angst over the last several years about the project itself. But moving beyond that, when you get to the project in completion, it's going to be a, a spectacular um, facility. And as a result of that, there are going to be things that will be drawing attention to Gloucester County from the entire Commonwealth to look at the school. And as we move forward, you know, we want to make sure that we give our kids the best opportunity to provide them with all of the technological advances and things that they need. So the, the premise that we have taken is not to go out and try to be extravagant, to try to get the things that we basically need at this point in time, you know, with a couple of positions here or there to get the building up and operational, and then taking a look as we move forward if there are things that will come up that could be a part of comprehensive planning. Uh, Mr. Uh, Crisco. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add one point to it, and I know it probably seems like I'm up here throwing some darts at the school board, but I also want to make a point that my daughter has been involved with, you know, Peasley and Paige and my nephew and eighth grade and the modulars and everything else. We're also going to lose some of the ability to have some overlapping staff from the high school for these eighth graders. So I know there's going to be an increase. And, if you're going to tell me that it's going to be, you're going to be able to get that down to about eight people to operate a brand new building and, and still continue serving these kids, I, that, that's another fantastic job that the school board is doing for us. And I want to give you guys kudos for that. Okay, Mr. Pa uh, Ms. Parker. Uh, that's what I was going to say also, that I wanted to remind everybody that we have utilized our staff at the high school for a lot of our students at the page because of the proximity. We've been able to utilize a lot of our staff which we would no longer will be able to do. Uh, it has worked. Um, it's not the greatest at some, in some stages with some kids, but it has worked for us, and it's been a good thing that we've had to been able to rely on some of our staffing at the high school. So I think that once we pull that out, though, we're going to have to look at those numbers and replace those people. So I just didn't want to forget that. Thank you, Mr. Crisco. Okay. Uh I know the, the, uh, there are probably other questions, but we've got a number of other items that I'd like to get into, which is the uh, next topic, the construction update. Uh, Uh-oh. Sorry. Mr. Weinberger, let's make this the last question. Um, I just have a question. I don't know who to ask it to again. Uh, and looking on page um, 16. The shows the square footage of the old page, square footage of the new page, and it looks like it's about a little more than 20% larger. Does that sound pretty good? You said about 23,000 more square feet? Okay. Now, and, and this is just a question because I'm curious. The, um, 
the heating is going to be well over 50 percent more uh, in a new building and there's supposed to be all these new energy efficient things and is that due to uh, utility costs like uh, gas or oil or uh, electricity can somebody answer that we can hey, sure I mean yes <laughs> the, uh, again as I spoke earlier the there's a a transition from a major electrical use in the old page. Many of the heating elements were electrical as opposed to gas generated. If you look at the electrical difference, the electrical goes down. You're increasing your, your floor, your uh, square footage by what, 21, 23 percent, somewhere in that area. And uh, your electrical is going down, <clears throat> but because of the type of system, it's a, it's a water, water heated and cooled system, and the gas and the temperature of the water is maintained with, with gas. So the gas temperature will go up. And I said earlier, the, the, the big plus is that someday should the funding occur or should the desire be made to change to a geothermal, which of course is a very efficient system. So it, we're not uh, tying our hands with a type of system that, that can't be improved to the funding occur in the future. Okay. One more question. One more. Uh, one also thing to, to add to Mr. Hutch, if you look at based on page 16, the price per square foot that was used for the old page was a dollar eleven. Just the, the increase in utility costs from 2011 to 2015 is another 15, 16 cents, 15 cents there. Okay. Uh, my next question is about the water and sewer. Uh, that's greater than 50 percent off, though. Is there, can somebody explain to me why? I mean, is it because of Hampton Road sanitation, or is it, you know, something we're doing That's different? a significant portion, obviously, and then, of course, you know the water bill's going up higher. It's been raised also. But with regard to HRSD, there's a, a fee tacked on to the number of fixtures within a, within a facility. And the number of fixtures in the page, old page facility was uh, few in comparison to the new facility. And, of course, the number of fixtures is di driven by the building code. <laughs> so it's almost a catch-22 in that area. But then accompanying that, you have the increase in both water and sewer, which has gone up about uh, around the 5 percent range over the last, uh, last few years. And it's project projected to be somewhere in the 5 to 7 percent range. We haven't tied that down just yet for the next year. <clears throat> okay. Is that, are there any other questions before we move on? Okay, so let's move on to that next topic, which is the uh, item B or item two, the construction update. And at this point in time, um, our representatives that will be doing the construction update will be um, Mr. Shoreland, also Mr. Hutchinson, and Ms. Wright. So, Mr. Shoreland. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our project there at the New Page Middle School is moving ahead uh, on schedule on our critical path. Uh, I believe that you all have been distributed certain copies of the schedule and the financial report. Um, billing wise, we're only about 30 percent, but we anticipate in the next few months ramping up quite rapidly on the number of people and a number of activities on the site. This has been occurring since we started the job a year ago. You know, as time goes on, we start opening up more areas in which workers can, can work. We start completing more area of the project. We have uh, all the footings in place, all the foundations in place, many of the slabs. We just poured uh, about 80 cubic yards of second floor slab on Monday of this week. Now that's going to uh, open up more areas where you're going to see a lot more brick going on to the building. The skeleton, the steel skeleton, will be finished up within the next few weeks. The roof has already begun. So by the end of November, we should have that whole structure dried in where we can continue to ramp up activity inside now that we're weather tight. The other thing that started this week was more site work. So whereas we got like 60 people, we expect to have um, up to 100 within the next few months so we can continue through the, the winter season and reach our completion date. Our, our substantial completion date is still 
July 21st, uh, there's a 30 days after which the contractor is allowed to do finishing touches, so actually finish the contract. Right now, we've been tracking pretty well. Um, the roadway project has been underway for a couple of months, as you all know. We uh, closed down T.C. Walker Road to enable BASIC, the, the general contractor, on the roadway portion of that project to install culverts underneath the road and the base pavement. So uh, with the elimination of uh, through traffic down that thoroughfare, we're going to be able to increase our efficiency in completing that work. So we hope to have that open again on the 26th, uh, wider, safer, and better able to handle the traffic in the future. So we've got uh, things rolling up pretty quickly, and each month we've got to do that in order to meet our schedule. So, uh, you know, we've got sprinkler systems going inside, uh, electrical, plumbing, everything's kind of coming together which like it needs to. You can't just finish one function and then come in and start the next. This building's got to roll up with everything all ready to go. Um, is there any questions about the progress? Or? Yeah, Mr. Bazzani. I wanted to go back to my, my cost question before on page. Um, on the, on the Thank financial? You. Thank you, Chris. I can. I, I remember your question. Financials. The 183,000 foot offsite road work. What is? Why? Why is that an increase of 100? Well, the the form in which we present these financial reports indicated uh, where there was a a position in which we started on projected costs. Now, your particular question on the offsite road work, you you probably it, it, you may recall that. When we started our design on the road improvements, <coughs> we completed those designs based on working with a segment of the Virginia Department of Transportation local, thinking that, thinking that that's where we would be coordinating our design work. Now, we had a subconsultant. And then in July of 2013, that project became, it changed, and it became a revenue sharing project with the Virginia Department of Transportation. So once we became eligible for those funds, that design moved in, in the department to a different squad. I'll, I'll term them as a design review squad within the Depar Department of uh, Transportation. Therefore, they took a fresh look at, at the designs that had already been completed up to that point, and bid, by the way, and there were some changes that they required us to do. So we performed those changes to the design, which were significant enough that that project had to be rebid. Once we rebid it, because of these minor, or I'll, I'll call them minor, that increased the cost a little bit. Now, the other thing that that number, that $183,000 contains, is an ad after that project was finally approved by VDOT and bid and awarded to the contractor. The, a part of the requirements to the locality is to engage testing firms and inspection firms that are cer VDOT certified to perform the on-site testing and inspection and that, that's in that cost also. The design, this is for the change in the design of the road work going from the school to Route 17. Is that what that is? The 183,000? The, the improvements to the, well, let's see, say that question again, well, please. Well, Off-site road work, is that, is that the road work? Oh, is, okay, I'm sorry, that's T.C. Walker Road. Yeah, I'm and sorry, T.C. Walker Road to Route 17, that, that's... Yes. And an additional amount of cost to, to, to augment that road to, to supply traffic into Route 17. Why wasn't that, why wasn't that figured out in, in the beginning when we bid this thing and knew exactly what the road would look like? And uh, why, it, why did it change since we, you know, we provided funding to you for a certain amount of work to be done and some, and some, some cushion for, you know, where, why did this change? Well, it always was hundred. programmed into the project. But it, it changed when it became a revenue sharing project. Then we, the locality, is going to receive 50% uh, of that cost is going to be covered by VDOT. 
but it, it's always been within the project scope. I'm still not getting my head wrapped around that. Um, it, the incremental cost, additional cost, is 183,000. I, I don't understand what what that incremental cost is for, other than you saying it's it's design scope changes to the road, right? Which you you should you did not anticipate at the time you at the time you formulated your estimate for the new school. You did not anticipate these additional design changes when you... Not those exact ones, right. no, but we always contain a contingency in all of our projects to cover and unanticipated. Well, this because is, at this the is, beginning is, of the projects, there are a lot of things we're not going to know until we get 80% of the design. There are so could, many facts and figures and costs that are revealed as the design progresses, right. maybe, and maybe even as could, the construction progresses. Maybe I could add to, to help Mr. Pisani. Mr. Pisani, the... Uh, as you understood, back in July of 2013, that was that that whole improvement to the road, TC Walker Road and 17 access was bid, and it was almost that we I don't even I think we were just about awarded it to a contractor, and then when it rolled over and we were eligible for the revenue sharing with VDOT, it became under some new requirements of VDOT, and to or in order to get that 50 percent share. From VDOT, is that going to is that going to offset the 183,000? Well, yeah, as part of, that, of it. Yeah, as as part of that, VDOT required us to have some additional requirements that weren't there initially, and that that was, and we were already past the bid con, bid that's, point. And that's shown as resources available. But wasn't yeah. wasn't this, on the following page? Thank you. I understand, but wasn't the specification for the road set by VDOT, and now they changed it to augment it for more requirements on that the same road to cost? Yeah, they, they they it. Mr. Records I'd, has some comments. I'd like to address it too, because I I do understand this issue, and I I came late to this whole budget process when all this was established for Page, but have been following it very closely, and um, the game changed in the middle of reviewing the plans basically VDOT changed the game they required new things be done of the plans when we thought we were at 95 percent just because we received the revenue sharing proportion so of that hundred eighty three thousand dollars that you see right there if you flip to the next page ninety one thousand five hundred fifteen dollars of that was was in essence paid for by the state so there was a net change because of this change of 91,000. 91, and the total budget of the project has not changed. Other line items, as you can see the other five or six line items there, adjusted accordingly to absorb the $91,000. Um, fortunately, there was an areas, and I don't know the details as well as Scott does, but uh, you know the site preparation bid decreased by $12,900. There was, we took $89,000 out of digital infrastructure. We had to pay for contingency items on things that in fact weren't part of the project. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of variables in what causes the change, but with respect to that VDOT issue, it, it didn't change the overall budget. It only shuffled it, shuffled the shuffled it with inside of okay, the budget. I, okay, thank you, I understand. And then, and then one more question. The, on, we're talking about schedule now. I can talk. I can ask questions about the schedule now, right? Yeah. Not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is the delivery date April of fifteen? April eighth of fifteen. Is that the delivery date? July twenty first, twenty fifteen. Okay. Could could just for my edification, this this schedule doesn't mean anything to me unless I see a Gantt chart or a PERT chart. Do you guys, the, the contractor, is supposed to deliver that on a monthly basis or he's biweekly with his invoice? Is he not? Uh, he delivers a, an updated schedule um, based on his completion, and then he usually revises it. If, he's, if he stops tracking on it, then we ask him for a revised schedule. So he does track it. He, he provides you this schedule, or does he provide you a, a network schedule, a, a Gantt chart or a PERT chart? It's a uh, Gantt chart. Can I, can I get a copy of that, please? Yes. Thank you. I have it. Uh, have it in PDF, I'll try and send Perfect. it to you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Mr. Hudson. Um, this is a new school, state of the art. What did you do to change the digital infrastructure? I guess that's you, Mr. Hudson. That's a good question. 
the digital infrastructure, the original, the original amount there was a budgeted amount inserted. And then the, after refining the proposals, we just adjusted it down based on the number of facilities. Now the digital infrastructure includes fire alarm, closed circuit TV, and uh, security entrances, door swipes. And we found some duplications, so we just adjust, adjusted it down. There again, we want to insert some of these figures, and then as the project progresses, we're able to more refine the needs of the school, and that's reflected in that adjustment. So it, the, the changes are just mainly for security issues versus educational purposes in this in this particular that line, line item, item in this particular line item yes mr Crisco. i guess th this question um mr hudson uh, you know we have all these projected costs with adjustments and everything else but then get all the way down here and a, a speaker spoke to this earlier you know, in our furniture and technology, you had a nice article in the Gazette a while back about how much furniture that we had gotten, but I don't see an adjustment here. Is this number that we're looking at still what it's going to take to finish off furnishing this school, or is this is there going to be is there going to be an adjustment coming on that side of things? Um, Ms. Wright's on her way up, but I will With, say that that we're still working on that particular uh, defining what our needs are going to be. Right. I don't want Mr. Hutchinson's hard work to, 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 to not go noticed. We don't have flexibility to use those funds for other things. Um, if you'll look on the second page of the financial report, there are three items that make up that line, and they are insurance proceeds, furniture, um, and actually um, these funds can be used for any building contents. It does not necessarily have to be furniture. And then we also have VPSA technology funds, $400,000, and we had some funds that were contributed uh, in memory of Dr. Jean Pugh for technology, and that was 16657 With the VPSA technology funds, if we don't need them for PAGE, we can use them anywhere in the school division. These are state technology funds. Uh, the insurance proceeds... We will have to use that for contents for PAGE. We cannot defer that to the building or to any, anywhere else. It will have to be for contents for PAGE. But it can be used for small items, uh, materials, paper, and even things of that nature. Anything that was uh, typical that was destroyed during the tornado, we can use those funds for that. Yeah, Mr. Records and then Mr. Pisani. One more question real quick. Um, the, the PDF version of the Gantt and Per chart, are they in color? So it identifies the critical path readily? Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Records. Um, there's on the, the second page or page um, 18, there was just something I, that I wanted to make a comment about, uh, and that is when the project was bid out, there was a base bid, and then there were three items that were bid out as alternate items that were not in the budget and are currently not in the budget to do. And those three items are a baseball field, a practice field, and a gravel parking lot. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the base bid did include two fields, two soccer fields, this is a short or a soccer field and a softball field or something. Softball anyway, two, field. two fields are in the base bid. That's correct. But these, these other two fields and a gravel parking lot is not currently in the base bid, therefore not in our budget. And granted, the cost to do the baseball field at $285,000 is for everything for that baseball field. But we have a pile, a massive pile of dirt next to the, the building that most of which will get used with the earthwork operations that have yet to happen at the school. But then there's an excess amount that that pile will shrink to that is slated for the construction of these two fields. And, um, you know, it's something I think ultimately I know I would like to see us do if it's possible for us to do because one, having to move dirt twice costs more money, you know, having to have a pile of dirt right next to a new building is something that we'd like to try to resolve. 
Um, you know, we do have money in our contingency, but we're far too early still in this project to start burning contingency funds up on things like this that aren't absolutely required. Um, but there is a pretty healthy contingency there. So I guess my point is, with respect to next year's budget, this may be something that we want to look at because it's going to cost us or it's going to be a whole lot cheaper to do that work right there, which is probably somewhere. At, do we have a feel for the neighborhood of the cost value to do that work at this time? I don't know if it's, it's not that exact amount, but just to move the dirt is something less than that. And it's something we seriously should consider because you have erosion issues with unstabilized ground. And it's, it's something that we should really think about trying to fund if there's any way that we can try to fund it. Um, that would be a smart move because it's going to cost a whole lot more money when it's all said and done to come back in and try to put that pile of dirt where it should have gone in the first place. That's it. So was I asked a question there? I'm sorry. Okay. How much would it cost to move the pile of dirt that we're going to have left over to the location in which it needs to reside to build these two fields, which are not part of our bid? Uh, just the minimum amount of cost to clear the trees and the stumps from the, the area of that optional baseball field, strip the topsoil, and then take that fill soil from that existing stockpile and get it over to the, the area in which it will be used in the future stabilize it with some seed, about 165,000. So a portion of that. Thank you. 285. Right. Because the rest of it's in fences and dugouts and home right. plate. And but at least it would be away from the, the new school and in, in the area that where it can be used in the future. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Um. On page 17, under other expenditures, park and recreation lights. Can you explain that to me? This amount uh, that's uh, featured here, Mr. Weinbarger, was transferred to the county parks and rec because they actually pay for the lighting that was on the feel at page, and this is what we received for the destruction of the lighting. Well, where is it going to go? Um, you'll have to refer that question to the county because they already have the money. The Parks and Rec has that money? Yes. I, I, I believe there was mention of Woodville Park, but I, I can't, I don't know for sure. They just bought new lights right before the tornado hit on that side. They got destroyed. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, seeing no other questions, we can move on to the next item, which is the Consolidated Transportation Function Study. Mr. Lindsay? Uh, members of both boards, I appreciate your opportunity to let me speak to you tonight. Uh, my objective this evening is to provide the boards with an update to the initiative of developing a site and feasibility study of a consolidated transportation function for the county and schools. Um, a similar update and discussion was offered by Mr. Curry at the Board of Supervisors meeting on September 2nd, 2014. Um, as your purchasing agent for both boards, my remarks will center on the active procurement proposals that have been received for the feasibility study, but I would also like to share with you recommend, uh, my recommendation for some alternative um, opportunities. Uh, let me tell you from for some past research I've been doing to try to bring to, to the boards because I didn't know if you, you were aware of this, but um, I find that there's been similar consolidation reviews that have been conducted in the past and it's been with limited success. Um, it appears the last study was conducted in 1998 and included various administrative functions. Um, although fleet, fleet management was also included in the study, the resulting consolidation recommendation was conditioned on the reliance as a priority that a significant capital expenditure as a priority among other competing capital needs would take place. Simply stated, um, uh, the, 
the county administrator at that time in 2000 came in and immediately um, ceased the consolidation efforts because he said there was no chance in bleep that we would ever get the money to build a building. Um, and it stopped. Our present initiative, uh, however, that we're both working on and as boards in early two, uh, 2014, a revised initiative began uh, to seek proposals for a site and feasibility study for this uh, tra consolidated transportation function. Uh, at the combined meeting of the boards on March 27th, both boards moved to advertise two proposals seeking, consultants, uh, seeking consultant offers for an engineering review of a consolidated function and an operational review of combining the county and schools administrative functions. Staff painstakingly, I went through these tapes over and over and over, <laughs> Uh, reviewed the minutes of the combined meeting to ensure a concise and well-articulated scope of service was developed that includes study reviews limited exclusively to the Old Page Middle School, the T.C. Walker Education Site, and the County Garage Site at Route 17 near Providence. Let me first tell you all about the operational review. Um, I, I actually developed a RFP and put an RFP out on the street in early April, and we received some proposals back in May. Now remember, this is the operational. This is in trying to administratively put the functions together. These proposals were passed to an evaluation committee, but no action was pursued uh, due to a superior proposal that were received from the engineering review. Now this might be a little, make a, a little screwy, but I'll try to explain to you. Let me talk to you a little bit more about the engineering review. This is the second proposal. Um, we also, purchasing, went to um, sought a proposal from RRMM which presently holds an on-call contract with the county for various small AE services and requested an engineering review of the consolidation study. For information, RMMM is one of seven firms that hold a multi-term on-call AE contract with the county, which was a result of a past uh, competitive negotiation process. The selection of firms that compete for professional AE services is based solely on their superior qualifications, and state law doesn't even allow me to to negotiate price to be considered as an award factor. That's in the law. However, so what we do is I get with them and I'm telling them, this is what my budget is, what is your fee, where can we meet? In a lot of instances, we will, we will negotiate hours. So that's how it's conducted. Of course, we talk about money, you know that. But anyhow, with that said, um, person could have selected one other firm of those seven. I could have done that. However, but remember, the whole thing is based on qualifications. So I selected RMMM because I felt like they already possessed institutional knowledge of the schools and could probably come well-versed and would reduce their mobilization costs. Uh, with these I, I really believe the receipt of these two offers that we accomplished the direction of the boards. But now let me take you from here, from these proposal results. Although the intent of this dual solicitation effort was to seek offers from these two distinct work areas, RMM provided an offer that contained a superior strategy for both. In other words, I asked them for just an engineering review, but when they came back, they gave me not only the engineering review, but they gave me the operational review. Um, further, and what they did was, with that, in their initial, this initial offer was received in April and was reviewed by staff. Uh, discussions were conducted with RMM to further define the deliverables and to target their offer in a more conservative and affordable approach. From these discussions, RMM uh, submitted a revised offer in late May, which refined their work product and lowered their cost. This document is the one that's included in your work packet. Um, purchasing participated with Mr. Curry in transmitting this revised offer to county leadership in early July for consideration. Um, let me just a little bit talk about what they provided in this proposal which had the dual tool shot at it. it they divided it into steps, parts, and in total because I kept telling them I want to be able to pick and choose what I want in here. I don't want to have to buy the whole thing if I don't want it. And they, they did come back and do that because um, I was looking for that flexibility. I can tell you that right now the cost for the initial operation and engineering review ranged from a part one, step one at a, at a cost of $44,045 to the, the, the full operational engineering review at $103,305. This is the reduced cost, okay? However, this fee does not include the development of final drawings, construction documents, and the various costs related to wetlands, soils, and, and uh, topographic surveys if we actually went forward and built a building. For this work, it is likely that I would actually uh, advertise a separate um, competitive negotiation procurement as I did when I did PAGE. I didn't use this contract and went it with a separate bid. But I want to talk to you about some alternative um, 
opportunities that might be at hand. And although my, my primary mission as your purchasing agent is to lead our county and schools through a highly regulated and legalistic public procurement process, sometimes I do step back and question if the expected results can be derived from our purchasing efforts. In other words, I look at it this way, is the juice really going to be worth the squeeze on what we're going to do here? And you know, as I mentioned a little early in 2000, the county administrator curtailed the efforts to consolidate the fleet management function because it was realized that adequate funding would never materialize to the construction of a consolidated facility in light of so many other competing capital needs. I saw this again when Mr. Uh, Records correspondence with Mr. Curry on September 6, and he stated if there's not a commitment to fund or build, that there was really no point to move forward. Um, I, I do agree with you, and so does Mr. Curry. Unquestionably, the objective for any consolidation effort is always twofold. First, it's to reduce duplication of effort, and second, it's to reduce our cost. In a communication from Mr. Curry to Mr. Records on September 8th, he identified that the county currently has two FTEs assigned to fleet ma maintenance in a very small shop that services the public works and public utility vehicles. This limited staff also allocates a half share of one of those FTEs to the county's mosquito control efforts, effectively reducing the staff complement to 1.5 FTEs. Realizing this, you know, I must, again, I'm looking at the juice again. I question the, the, the spending of excess of $100,000 for a study to probably give us the same recommendations that we got in 1998. Uh, this is especially true when realizing that such a recommendation would again be conditioned on the reliance that the schools and the, and the county would support a significant capital expenditure for a consolidated function as a priority among any others. Uh, I do believe this is unlikely. But so let me give you a recommendation for some alternatives. Um, I would offer the boards my recommendation to seek further savings through the intelligent outsourcing of various county, county and school services. We have already been successful in outsourcing the entire fleet maintenance needs to the sheriff's office. Um, he used to have his, his vehicles at, um, serviced at all kinds of places, at schools, at, at uh, county garage. Now uh, that's done through two contracts that we have in place with local service providers. These contracts could easily be expanded to serve the majority of the, fleet, the rest of the fleet maintenance needs of the public utilities and public works department. Such an action may also allow the current staffing of 1.5 FTEs to be reassigned for additional services within the county. Additionally, if we outsource these remaining county services, there really isn't anything left to be consolidated. In other words, there's only the standalone bus garage. I offer that, that the maintenance of school buses should probably remain uh, with the school division's transportation function because there's simply a limited local vendor base that could effect, uh, effectively compete for this work. In other words, if I even tried to bid it, there's not going to be many people out there that can service a fleet of buses, a large fleet. However, there might be other opportunities where the maintenance of some of the school's passenger vehicles could be serviced locally through our existing contractors. Um, such a strategy could reduce this taxing effort that presently exists on the current bus garage, and, and not to mention this, where the staff is literally challenged every day with supply and demand needs. Um, I can tell you I've been up to the school bus garage many times, and I am just flabbergasted um, by the remarkable job those people do, keeping all those vehicles moving. And they, they are impeccably maintained, and they transport our children every day safely from point to point. But I want you to know that outsourcing is not a new concept for the county and our school divisions. For example, schools has been proactive in outsourcing a number of services that range from all of their HVAC, uh, HVAC facility maintenance needs to is something as extreme as we just privatize all our pizza making. And um, now all pizzas are, are done by a local source and delivered back into the schools versus us having to cook them there. We, they literally can do it better, faster, and cheaper. All of this is with contracts, and all these things I do, I want to tell you about one other contract we just signed last week, and we've, um, we've entered into a contract to outsource all of our electrical maintenance services at the water plant. All these contracts that I develop always have the situation where I write them for everyone. So not only did I do this for this the water plant, but I always gave this information to utilities and to um, public works group that this is an opportunity that's available, not to mention schools. In my world, I call this a make or buy analysis. And, and <laughs> as you can see, Mr. Bazzani is very well aware of that uh, because you know it, it needs to be a, basically a standard operating procedure on where I question, you know, outsourcing potentials where internal function could be considered. I'm not saying, take, telling y'all we go in and grab big hunks and try to do it, but we do pieces at a time where we can hopefully keep that business in the county also. That's my number one goal. 
I believe that both the county and schools do a good job with this, but there's always other potential activities that could be uh, considered in future. Finally, rather than seeking a place to establish a consolidate, uh, consolidated transportation function, I would recommend to review examine, and examine ways to exploit the economic uh, development potential of the various parcels contained in the old Page Middle School site. Likely that the bus garage and certainly the water tower is going to remain on the current site, but this does not prevent the review of considering other parcels contained within this property for future business potential. RRMM included this service in, in their proposal, which may be the best bang for a buck to pursue in this offer versus looking at trying to build a building. I realize that I may be taking you all down a very different path, but I feel like as a purchasing agent, I had to come to you and tell you my feelings and when I'm seeing the successes we're having. Um, I, I work with my other my customer schools every day. I realize their, their um, school facility maintenance needs and they are large. I can tell you that right now. Um, I, I'm just, I don't see where we're going to turn around and build a ultra modern uh, bus garage that has all the different things you have to put in with all the environmental protections now in relation to if we could go in here and start just doing bits and pieces with outsourcing and, and do a better job at it. Um, I hope you take this in the spirit I'm giving to you and I certainly am available for any questions. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you. We really appreciate the effort that you put to save the county and the taxpayer money. With that, Mr. Bazzani. I just, I just have a small comment. I'm glad that you jumped into the outsourcing frying pan with me. So thank you. Thank you. OK, the floor is open to questions. Uh, Mr. James. Mr. Chairman, I just had a couple of comments, too. I, I was very happy with what Mr. Lindsay had to say, too. Um, it's a real pleasure to have somebody stand up here and, and honestly say what they think, and, uh, and it'd be a good solution to a lot of people's problems. Um, I was listening to what you had to say first about um, RRM and MM, and, uh, and e going even further, RRM and M have even talked to Mercury, whoever they are, uh, to be involved with this project. And, and I felt like then that that this had gotten beyond what we were, what we were uh, considering the scope of what we needed to do. And I think uh, before we get into spending money on different, different items uh, that Mr. Lindsay uh, alluded to, uh, we need to find out uh, who wants to be a part of this project. The sheriff is, is enjoying uh, outsourcing his work and obviously is saving money by doing that. And uh, some, of the, some of the county cars are being outsourced as well at this point. And um, without too much trouble, we could probably outsource all of those and probably some of the utility stuff uh, and parks and recreations and all of that. So we need to make sure that we want to spend money on a facility like this before we do, before we engage these people to, to uh, do uh, site work for us and all that stuff. Um, if there's a cheaper way, we need to go the cheaper way. If we can, if we can outsource all of these different departments, vehicles, um, and and possibly uh, all of the rest of our vehicles as well, and only have to deal with the school buses, then possibly we can uh, spend some money and and uh, redo the bus garage that's there now, since it's going to be a lot less vehicles and all of that. Maybe we can spend some money on that building. And that facility, and and ultra modernize that, and uh, and save a pile of money, pay some teacher salaries, stuff like that. So I think it's uh, I think it's some real uh, food for thought in all of this, and I thank Mr. Lindsay for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. Mr. Meyer. Uh, I was not happy with the proposal that was put forth, and now I find out. I don't have to be happy with it, and I'm glad for that. Uh, I think what you proposed uh, makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm a little curious. I feel like I missed some time somewhere, but uh, the proposal was given to you on uh, May 21st, and this is a few months later. I'm just wondering why we weren't having this discussion two months ago. I, I don't know the answer to that. Ms. Hensley. 
just want to go on. I know that at the Board of Supervisors meeting, when Mr. Lindsay and Mr. Curry were there talking about this issue recently, that I think it was Mr. Hudson said, as the starting point, just to remind where this conversation started, is what is the use of the page property? Because if through the county's economic development, group or however it is, is if the best use is to have the school garage there, then I don't think anyone's chomping at the bit to do that, but the, the county's been talking about what should we do, and the school board's definitely been talking about what should we do with this property. It's centrally located in the county. It's a big piece of property. And the transportation garage and the water tower are issues to any further development <coughs> of that property to attract businesses or add to the tax base or something along those lines. So I just want to remind everyone or anyone who's watching that I think that was the beginning of the conversation. It wasn't that, you know, we're clamoring for a new garage or anything like that, but if that parcel is going to be used in another way, the school board has to have somewhere to put all the buses, and that's it, the big concern for us. It was an hour and 48 minutes of discussion. <laughs> I went through it every second of the way. <laughs> Mr. Records. I think you did a great job summarizing where you think we should go here in the future um, because I, I questioned um, after looking at the proposal, uh, it sounds like s s many others did too, you know, if this was, if this, pro what's specified in this proposal is the right path. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe the very beginning of it is on the right path, but I don't think the end of it is by any stretch. I agree. Um, and, you know, I, I would agree with Mr. Meyer. Um, I think this topic is a topic, you know, the, the last joint meeting we had, we had an hour and 48 minutes worth of conversation about it. And it's something that either we need to decide not to do anything and we won't do anything, or we need to figure out an action path forward because trying to do this in six and seven month increments, this is going to take 15 years. Um, so, whether that means that we need to sit down together more often to determine what it is that we're going to do if we are going to do something, then I think we should do that. Um, and I also think maybe to help the time period side of it is that, um, you know, the proposal mentions, and I'm just going to pick a couple points out of there just to, to make a couple points, and that is, you know, it mentioned a study committee being put together for whatever it is. Now, whether we're outsourcing or whether we're doing a new facility, so be it. But it still means that there potentially would be a committee. And I do think that that's a good idea. I think it should be totally formulated in an absolutely different fashion than the Page Middle School Committee was done. Um, and I think that that would then help us track in, in, in that we have a focus group of people in essence staying on top of this because granted we've had we have a new superintendent we had a lot of time we were spending finding a new superintendent there's been a lot going on in the last couple months to trying to add this to that probably would have been complicated anyways but again as we move forward we should we should have a plan of where we're moving I guess is, is the point that I want to make um, and, and outsourcing may very well be, be um, the solution to that. I mean, at the end of the day, as you all mentioned, it's been mentioned again, there's no point in really bringing it back up again, but we have limited vendors that can service buses in the county. So trying to outsource our bus repair is something I just don't, I guess, first blush of that is I don't know that that's going to work. But um, again, as mentioned, I mean, the old Page Middle School site has a water tower on it. There isn't, we're not doing anything, we're not moving the water tower. You know, so there, there's, a, there's a use that exists there that could be harmonious with the bus garage. The bus garage is in need of repair, but so is a whole bunch of other things. Utilities, buildings are in need of repair, so we have to prioritize. You know, that's not our purview, but it's y'all's purview to prioritize these things. And, you know, if we want to move on page, then, then let's move on it, um, I guess, is, the only point that I wanted to make, and, and if we, if we, if we're not, then we should we should stop talking about it. Thank you, Mr. Records. Are there any other comments, questions by the boards, by both boards, Mr. Meyer? Uh, on the proposal on the step two, uh, I guess we're at six, six uh, J. But one of the items, I'll tell you what it is real quick, Bill. 
but it's uh, property appraisals. It seems to me one of the missing elements that we have here in deciding what to do with that property is we don't have a good estimate of what that property would be worth if it is used in this fashion or that fashion. And then it may be something that we want to move towards the front of the line in helping us assess what to do going forward. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Do I see any other hands up questions, comments? So what's the purview of the boards to move on this, to put it on hold? Take Mr. Lindsay's suggestions with regard to the uh, recommendations he made? Mr. Lindsay, what do you think should be done next? Um, I would certainly continue our outsourcing efforts. I believe I would entertain um, talking to RMM again about coming in and looking at, at the old page site on opportunities that are available, economic development opportunities that are available. Can the, can the parcels be looked at? Can we, can we then go to the schools and let them say, is there opportunities there? That again, we might have a situation where we can pick up quite a bit of funding for future projects out of that. Um, you know, for school projects. I mean, it might be a good opportunity. It might fund an expansion of, of the um, bus garage. I don't know. Um, you know, you simply need to, to run a, where the water tower and the bus garage is, I mean, you could simply run a easement down through there and subdivide the other pro properties. I'm saying this very generally, but to me, we could get a consultant maybe to help us with that. That would be, in my opinion, would be the best money we could spend. And then come back to the boards and say, what do you want to do? So, so I'm, I'm assuming that we just shelve this and, okay, Mr. Crisco, yeah. I think with this contract that we have with RMM, you're in, you have the ability to do some of these negotiations without anything yes. other can, going on other than you making a phone call. Time. Yes. Um, I have one thought here, just kind of thinking this about this, is that it, it probably might still be appropriate to have somebody architect some architect figure out what I guess at a minimum over a 20-year period or whatever our window needs to be from a planning standpoint what the bus garage is in its ideal situation you know if we were to renovate the existing one we were to go build a new one we do need to get a handle on we know what we have now it works but it could it could be Done, it could be better if we're going to invest money. And I guess the question would be, if you, had, if you did engage an architect to figure out what does this new facility look like or renovated facility look like, how many bays are we adding or how many bays does it need to have, that that would be a good thing to have because, you know, at some point in time when we get, if we get to the point of talking about what future uses would exist on that site, I think you have to be able to analyze does it make sense to use... I don't know, whatever, eight acres, 10 acres, however many acres along that frontage of property, or are we better to then take that and put it somewhere else, which who knows at this point where that somewhere else is. I mean, we've talked through what, where those places could be, but one of them is that site, and the other one's TC Walker Road. So um, it might not be bad still to engage an architect, and I don't think it has to be RMM. To, to do the services that we need to have because they we're not talking about their um, their their knowledge of, of, of sites where we, we just need an architect to design a building for us so um, that's just kind of one idea thank you mr. records uh, mr. Hudson but in doing that mr. records we'd also have to tie in the appraised value and also future development sites at Page to see if another site on Page or somewhere else is better suited for the future of the county in 20 years. I mean, that's, you've got to put all that in there together. Well, that's I, why I agree with you. That I, I agree, think, but oh, you've got to have a building footprint first. Right. And the question is, is the building footprint, whether we put the building footprint on that site or another site, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we do need to have the appraised values, but but we can't appraise it until we have the use so we're just we're kind of going to be we got to establish the guidelines that the appraiser is using to appraise the value by because if it's a you know it's appraised as parkland is one thing versus being appraised as some economic development site it's going to have a two totally different values 
Mr. I think Mr. Records has made some very good points, and given his background and understanding of some of these, you know, maybe this is a good direction to take. And Mr. Lindsay, you've made some excellent recommendations with regard to uh, uh, the comments you've made. You know, we can move forward with that. And then with this particular proposal, I guess we just shelve it. Correct. The, the consolidation effort. Okay, yes, let's shelve it, move forward, and then uh, I think uh, Mr. Rickards, like I said, had an excellent recommendation, at least to get that footprint, and move forward with an action plan that we should develop with regard to the page property. We can do that. Okay. Um, Mr. Woods, one oh. question. As, as part of that, would we do what you said, Mr. Lindsay, is to go out there and, and, and get an evaluation of the page property as it stands today? with the water tower and and the bus that, terminal that there be, that, so that, that we be, know if it's yes, potentially in, um, appealing to to somebody out there from an economic development standpoint that would be my recommendation and oh. if, if i can be so <laughs> blunt it's it's hard i work for a client um when i deliver my services um i don't know who my client is so in my opinion is I would I hate to do this to you, Dr. Clements, but I would see schools as being in my client in that situation and let us to work up a scope uh, of, of direction and then I go through the schools and we take it from there because it is their property. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay, and we very much again appreciate your efforts and uh, the recognition that you've received is and all the things that you've done is certainly well well deserved, well earned, and we appreciate it very much. Appreciate it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a break before we move on. Five, five or ten minutes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's continue with our agenda tonight, and we're going to move to item uh, 7C, the comprehensive plan for the school division, and uh, Dr. Clements will be making that presentation. Yes, good evening again, everyone. Um, and as I think about the meeting that has occurred thus far in, in the discussion, and one of the things that, you know, that continuously <coughs> comes up as a, as a plan for the future, you know, a focus, an action path. And this, is um, this goes directly um, in accordance with that same theme, um, developing a comprehensive plan. And part of the, the school district's requirement, actually, by the code is to develop a district-wide comprehensive plan. That was one of the things that I had discussion about with our school board um, in our retreat um, that happened back in July as to, you know, what the direction would be for the future. And in and, and doing so, and in looking at the, the Code of Virginia and requirements, um, we discussed the possibility of developing a, a district-wide comprehensive plan that would move and spearhead the direction of the school division over the next six years. And in doing so, and I won't read all of the elements there, but because you have that at your um, table for your purview, but part of 221-253-13-6 states that each local school board shall adopt a district-wide comprehensive unified long-range plan based on data collection and analysis of the data and how the data will be utilized to improve classroom instruction and student achievement. 
And as I've had meetings with some of you board members as well as Board of Supervisors members, you know, some of the things that we have talked about is, you know, what's the plan for the future? You know, what's the direction? What are the metrics that are based on developing something that we can utilize and measure and sets the framework and the division for going forward? So this is the, the start of that in which we are soliciting input from all community stakeholders in the development of a comprehensive plan that should drive us for the future. And as I thought, you know, what is the community's desire for Gloucester County Public Schools? This is not an entity that is just specific to what the superintendent may want or the school board may want. This is a community. This is a community school division. So having input from all entities and sectors of the community will be vital in terms of developing a comprehensive plan. And so we're going to have several meetings over the next several months to start this process in the efforts to develop a plan that will be um, the guide for us in the future. Two of our board members are already um, agreeable to serving on a committee. Um, I would invite you as members of the Board of Supervisors, if you can, attend meetings and, and want to even be on the committee because you are a part of this comprehensive planning process in my mind, just as well as you know, other members of this community. Our first meeting that we have is scheduled to be um, next Wednesday, starting at 7 o'clock here, um, right back in this facility, to start going over the requirements for the comprehensive plan, because there are basic things that, require, that are required of us to, to put in a comprehensive plan. But then when we think about it, you know, what do we really want? And I think about things that are based on instruction, I think about community and parental involvement. I think about efficiency of operations, being fiscally responsible of taxpayers' dollars. Now, all of those things should be a collective effort of what we do in terms of the development of this plan. You know, one of the things that we have to think about when we, we think about instruction, you know, we have to think about accrediting and, and, and what our accreditation ratings are. Um, for, to bring everybody up to speed, you know, the, the state accreditation ratings came out today, as a matter of fact. And, and we know that you know, there are some areas where we've got some improvements to make, where some of our schools are doing well based on the state's accrediting model, but we've got other schools that um, need to have some improvements in, in reading and in mathematics. So what does it look like for us? What plan of action are we going to implement to try to make these improvements? Those things in my mind tie right into economic development that we've been talking about. When businesses and opportunities come for a county, one of the big factors that I think that people will want to know is, well, what's the status of your schools? And if you've got one high school that is the ending um, you know, entity for a whole county, well, how does that school stack up? So we've got to immediately work to move this school out of an accredited with warning status. That is not you know, optional for us when you think about the overall growth and development of not only the school and what we need to have for student academic performance, but for the county's welfare as well. So this will provide an opportunity to look at multiple entities. These things don't have to be the end all. We try to, to provide some initial categories because in the comprehensive plan, I think there are specific goals, there are objectives, there are timelines, there's status, and there's going to be impact. You know, what does it mean? so that it won't end up being a situation where it's a shelf document. There are many documents that I've seen in the past, it's a state requirement, but we don't want it to be just a state requirement and say, okay, well, we developed a comprehensive plan because we have to, but then we don't use it for anything. This should be what guides us as a community for what we want for this school division, and it should be stakeholder input. So I'm inviting you all to be a part of this process because we have to work together in every entity because the schools are the, is a, it's a, a product of this community. And we need to make sure that our students are prepared to be globally competitive um, in all entities. So there will be various areas. You know, I've heard compensation. Um, Mr. James talked about um, teachers. I've had conversations with Mr. Bazzani, and we've talked about, you know, um, incentives. You know, what do we want? And realizing that everything won't happen overnight, but if you don't have a plan for it, then nine times out of ten, it doesn't get accomplished. 
because there's no direction. So what I've seen upon my arrival, you know, there are bits and pieces of things that are here, but a unified strategic plan that guides us, that is our working, living, breathable document year after year, anal analyzing it, reviewing it, making you know, modifications, seeing where we are, taking things out, putting things in, doing what's best for the kids, doing what's best for this community. We don't have that. So now we're about to have that. So in, in terms of us having that, it requires all of us working together to do that so we can take a look at those things. You know, we've talked about staffing ratios. You know, what's ideal? We know what's state required, but we know what could be ideal for what we like in terms of class sizes. What does compensation look like? What does staffing look like? One of the things that we've talked about that may be an issue that needs to come up might deal around what's the best ideal, um, I would say, schedule for dealing with high schools. You know, we think about it, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little synopsis, and then, you know, we'll be able to move on for me not to belabor the, the situation. But um, when you think about staffing, and you think about right now, we've got an issue where one of the schools is accredited with warning in, in math. Okay, and let's say I'm on an alternating block at the high school where I go to Ms. Jones's classroom on Monday and I'm sick on Wednesday. Ms. Jones is out on Friday. Then we've got a staff development on Tuesday. So now that kid sees Ms. Jones the Thursday of the following week. So they haven't had instruction in mathematics potentially from last Monday to the following Thursday and we're trying to work on improving instruction and building on concrete skills. So there are some things that we have to take a look at across the whole board in terms of development and what do we want to make sure that we put students in the most optimum situations for learning to do what we have to do. I consider this school division to be a diamond in the rough. It has a lot of good things going on and it should be commended for the things that are happening. But there's some tweaking and there's some stuff that we need to do to put it to that level where it is one of the best, if not the best school division in the Commonwealth and in the nation. And I think we have the ability to do so, but we've got to put things in order strategically um, and let that guide us, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and this is how we do business. So this is just some of the preliminary, um, you know, gathering of information and data collection. And as we move forward, again, we encourage you to be a part of it. We want you to be a part of it. I welcome you to be a part of it because we've got to do what's best for the entire community. And most importantly, we've got to do what's best to serve these kids. And we can have um, the top school division, I believe, in the Commonwealth if we all work together and put those things in place. And if we have things that are inherent, that are barriers to that, let's talk about those. If they need to be removed, let's get them out of the way. You know, anything that's happening that's impeding us from being where we want to be, then we need to work together to make that happen. So you have it at your disposal. Come out to the meeting next week. Come to continuous planning sessions. And I'll entertain any questions that you may have at this point in time regarding um, the development of a comprehensive plan. Thank you, Dr. Clements. Um, Mr. Weinberger. I'd like to commend your thoughts, Dr. Clements. I think you're heading in the right direction. But I have a question on page 63. And uh, I'm looking at all the numbers of uh, the average daily membership, which is, you know, the number of days people go to school and all that stuff. And when you get down to 2012, we're minus 205 students. And then when you go to 13, you're down 176 students. But then in 14, it says we're only down 21 students. How come we had a spike? And, and I, I just want to know what's going on. It doesn't look like it's a normal progression. And the 21 is actually the lowest number of any number until we get to 17, which is the following year. So can somebody, anybody tell me how that was derived? Well, I think people knew I was coming, uh, Mr. Bazzani. <laughs> And so your number started to, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll let um, 
Ms. Ms. Wright give you some historical data on, um, on trends, but usually what I've seen in the past, we take a look at looking at, you know, what your trend has been, and there has been a, a downward trend you can see in terms of student enrollment in 11 of the past 12 years. Now, some of that, you know, can deal with lower birth rates. You know, you could have an increase of households that don't have um, school-age children. Um, some of it you can even think about when it comes to economic development, and I'm not saying that is a case or not, but I've been in previous places when I've seen the decrease in the student population be a direct result of the lack of employment opportunities in that locality. So if you don't have jobs, then you have people that are moving out of that locality. Um, this past year, like I said, and take a look at those numbers for 14, you take a look at where the numbers were ending as it relates to June 30th of 2014, and then taking a look at 15. So right now for this year, we're projecting that student enrollment at being 5,430 students. Now we'll take a look at that over the course of this year because there will be a September 30th um, ADM, there'll be a March 31st ADM, which kind of gives us you know, where we are. I can tell you in looking at the first 10 days, the, the membership is right at about 5404, somewhere in that range. So it's not exactly where it's projected at this point in time, but we haven't finished yet. So it'll be interesting to see where we are in September and then measuring again um, in March because that then has an impact on the amount of state funding that we get per child. Um, but to tell you why you had 205 decrease in the year before and then 176, I think again, because I haven't been here to see if there was something specific that, that, that caused that, I will defer that to uh, Ms. Wright to talk a little bit about how the calculation was looked at and then to any of my staff or board members who have been here who kind of can give you a little bit of insight about that type of um, decline in terms of student enrollment. Mr. Chairman, I think in part that has to go with, I think Mrs. Parker was talking about some of the bubble classes we have. We had a number of large graduating classes and our incoming kindergarten classes were much smaller. Turns out we have a bubble now at the middle school. So in a couple years when our fifth, sixth, seventh graders are the seniors and are graduating, we're going to have large graduating classes and hopefully we're going to ha we'll have large enough kindergarten classes that are incoming to keep up with it. But if you, if you go class by class, and I actually have the numbers here, grade by grade, you'll see it kind of ebbs and flows. And so I think that doesn't explain all of it, but some of the larger jumps, it has to do with the size of the graduating class and the size of the incoming class. Ms. Hensley is absolutely right. correct. The numbers that you're seeing here for the ADM uh, down through uh, 2014 are actual funded numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the points I'd like to make is that we serve many more students than what this number uh, alludes to. And just to give you some examples of these additional students, and they are uh, some of them are funded in other means and some are funded uh, uh, very okay. insufficiently. Uh, we serve uh, preschool disadvantaged students. Uh, for the present school year, we have seven classes, and each one of those classes can have up to eight um, physically challenged students, as well as we have some uh, typically uh, achieving peers that are also in those classes, and I believe we can have four of them. So we have about 12 children in each of those seven classes, we also have two VPI programs which are funded on a per pupil amount with a local share and each of those classes can hold 18 students. And we also have students that are served in regional special education programs and those students come out of the account because they're funded at a higher rate, they're funded at your composite index rate. So even this is the number that is funded for the ADM and so all of those things come out of that mix. And Mrs. Hensley is absolutely correct. We've had some, we've graduated some pretty large classes. One of the other things that we've looked at is the birth rates for Gloucester have, uh, have been much lower than what they were in the past. And so um, I did not bring any of that data with me, but you um, can get that data online. Um, 
the years that we're seeing are all below 400 in birth rates. And that's not a true picture because it depends on when your birth date is, but it gives you a little guesstimate of, of how many children you have in the community, but people are moving in and out. The one year that we did see an increase was 2010. And what we found out then, that was when the economy, uh, 2009 was kind of when the economy first went south. We did have, it during that point in time, a number of families who were moving in with families. And so we had multiple family households during that time as people were trying to uh, restructure and reorganize their finances. So, and then just uh, the, the, the 2015 is just a budgeted number. And again, we're going to be watching that all year um, and updating that you know, as we see additional changes. Mr. Crisco. I know earlier this evening uh, Ms. Hook spoke of the 10-day number. And I know that at y'all's last board meeting, y'all gave a six-day number. What has changed in those four days? And I know the next big update is September 30th. But what happened in those next four days? Um, we gained a few more students. We're 85 down from last year now. On our sixth day, I think we were 100, 113. 113 down. We're 85 down now, so we gained a few students. Ms. <laughs> Wright, are the numbers that we see in Gloss reflective of other communities um, this, in the surrounding area? Are they also going down, or do we see some communities going up, and is that reflective of better economy in those areas? There are some pockets where you're, you're seeing some housing growth and they're experiencing some growth, but I think in general, most of the communities are staying pretty level with very minimal growth. But um, I don't want to throw some names out there because I believe like Williamsburg, James City, I think is still experiencing growth, um, possibly Suffolk, because they're, they're still developing and growing in those communities. But I, have, I can go back and, and research that. I haven't done that recently. OK, thank you. Mr. Meyer. Let's quick add to that. The Middle Peninsula generally is seeing uh, population shrinkage. Dr. Clemens, I commend you for your statement that there's no reason this can't be the best school system, certainly in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So my question is, in your comprehensive plan, are we going to see the steps along that road that'll make us the best school system in Virginia. And just to tack on, recognizing that good schools help attract quality people will help increase the economic activity in the county, which helps increase the quality of the schools. So there's a, a, a uh, synergistic relationship between the growth in the local economy and the quality of the schools. But, Going back to the original thing, the comprehensive plan will tell us what we need to do to get there? Yes, absolutely. I think that what the comprehensive plan needs to entail is prescriptions, specific prescriptions, not just stating what the problem is, but what are we going to do to attack the problem? And as I talk with the executive staff and as we talk with um, you know, the community members about those areas when you talk about, okay, a high-flying school, and if we want the high school to return back to the status of, of, of being fully accredited, okay, well, we know that we've got some issues there that we have to work on that has been a downward trend in mathematics over the last three years. So part of this has to be about mathematics. You know, we have to attack the problem and come up with those specific um, methods that we're going to use to try to help get the mathematics up. And that could be in, you know, staffing. It could be in other resources. It could be in instructional methodology. It could be in curriculum alignment. It could be in professional development that's provided. You know, whatever the means are, we have to take a look at those issues that are um, problematic and then working to move those things out. When I take a look at the Commonwealth, I think the data um, talked today about the number of schools in the Commonwealth that actually increased to move into accredited with warning status. And when you take a look at the 130 plus divisions across the Commonwealth, I believe that there are only 22 divisions in the entire Commonwealth of the 130 plus that have all of their schools that are fully accredited. Well, we need to be in that 22. You know, and, and, and what are we going to do to um, make that happen? 
And I think some of the things will help next year when you go back and deal with having two fully operational middle schools. Some of the staffing can, some of the structural changes may help in some entities. Um, because now instead of operating a grade eight building where you are standalone, you're operating a six, seven, and eight building that will help in some instances. But the bottom line is nothing beats good teachers in the classroom day to day providing outstanding instruction, engaging rigorous to students. And so part of this plan is what do we do to attract and retain the best staff that we have so that Gloucester can be that beacon so people will want to come here. Um, and of course, that has to work within the framework of the county, being you know, responsible, not just going out and asking for a bunch of money that is not realistic. But what is it that we want as a whole? If we want good schools, if we want the best schools, then all of us, what are we doing? Let's take a look at the individual areas that we know that are problematic. You know, if we need more community and parental involvement, then what are those strategies that we're going to utilize to get to those places? If we have to take a look at staffing based on the example or scheduling that I just talked to you about, where I hope all you could see where that could present a problem if you're trying to improve a certain discipline and the way that the structure is right now might not be best serving what we need to do to improve in an area. So how do we take a look at all of those areas to work on improving that? You know, I mean, I think about it from my own child. If he was in a math class on a Monday, and there, based on what the situation is, could be a possibility that he wouldn't see that teacher for the next week. And that doesn't happen in all instances. I'm just giving you, you know, one of the real life scenarios that could actually happen. Um, what am I expecting of him in the end to achieve at the highest levels when he's not in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis with that highly competent, highly qualified teacher who's providing that instruction? And then at the end, what are the metrics? How are we taking, where are our graduates going? What type of tracking do we have to see? Are we producing graduates that are able to go out and be competitive in this society? Not only going to two-year and four-year institutions, but preparing them for career readiness, career and technical education, all of those things. You know, what is it that we want? Let's come up with it so that we're on the same plan together. There are certain things that we're required to do. So we can't get past the requirements in the federal situation because that is what it is. You know, the law indicates that we have to meet certain objectives that we're not meeting. So we've got to meet those and then we have to exceed those. And working together, I think that we can do, you know, some phenomenal things here as long as it's planned out well and, and we're working together as a unit. Um, but specifically the areas that are not where they need to be, we have to come up with a plan and we have to come up with a plan now and we've got to execute and implement that plan because we don't have time to lose. Mr. Pisani. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Combs. I think there's what, I'm, what we're all hearing here is a sea change in the direction of the school system. Um, I'm sure in your comprehensive plan you're going to have you might consider um, uh, quantitative milestones with respect to how the comprehensive plan is, you know, you if you're, whether or not you're following the path or not following the path, you'll have some quantitative milestones. But I want to commend you for the ideas. We've, 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 we've spoken, um, um, and uh, I think, I think with, your, with your leadership, I think the school's going to head in a good, good, good direction for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the, uh, the board? Any more questions for Mr. Dr. Clements? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. And uh, we'll move to item D, the school capital projects. Uh, Mr. Burak. Yes, th thank you, Dr. Worth. During the discussions associated with uh, developing the agenda for this evening, one of the, the large funded items um, that we discussed last year was school capital projects, and we were provided um, funding from the Board of Supervisors t with respect to those school capital projects, which was in a, in a total of $5 million. And one of the things we wanted to go over this evening was where we are with that funding and with those pr projects that were um, involved with that, with that funding. Uh, one of the biggest ones was the Petsworth School and, and the HVAC um, and roof replacement up there, which was in dire need. And at this time, I'll turn it over to, to Mr. Hutchinson and Dr. Clements. Uh, you, you found on the document 
um, for you, the, the cost, but I want to report um, specifically that it was a su successful project. And uh, I will have said this to the school board, but it was a tremendous effort by uh, a large um, uh, collection or collaboration between the contractor, the architect, and the, uh, our own staff. Uh, I think it's important to note that um, from the beginning, working with Mr. Lindsay in obtaining uh, <clears throat> architects and putting that bid out, we, we ended up with a very strong um, architect who had experience for being very detailed. And uh, those of you in the building industry know that a, a detailed architect uh, can save you time. And this one certainly saved us time. Uh, in fact, our first <clears throat> meeting that we had with the contractor and subcontractors included more people than are sitting around this uh, square right now. Everybody was there on time and wanting to know what part they played from the smallest entity of installing a uh, fire escape ladder to, uh, to the uh, rooftop to uh, you know, the most complex and replacement of the electrical panels that had to be redone. So it was really a, a combined effort. Uh, our staff alone put a lot of extra time in early and late. Uh, that included uh, Mr. Shoreland, who spent many mornings stopping by and evenings doing the same, along with uh, Mr. Simmons and um, Mr. Miller. We were able, uh, we were required, you'll note some uh, additional expenses from Mid-Atlantic on this page. We required uh, when opening, upon opening the roof to upgrade some of the wiring to fire rate of uh, a wiring because it's an open plenum system in, in the, uh, above, the roof, above the ceiling there. So things like that occurred. Um, we um, did some uh, upgrades uh, that were required for the electrical system. But um, Mr. Shoreland can certainly speak to the details. But the, bo the bottom line was school opened on time. The teacher's rooms were clean. The kids were there on the first day. Open house occurred uh, on a single night instead of two. But as far as our mission of having kids in school on time and getting educated on time, we, we, we were just pleased to say we accomplished that. The details of the, of the project is on, on page 74 with respect to the funding and, and where it was going. Uh, like Mr. Hutchinson said, the, the big, the main large positive item on that was uh, the project was done and completed during the summer months when the students weren't there, which was um, a, a big, huge challenge. But with uh, Mr. Shoreland and Mr. Hutchinson's leadership there, we, we got everybody in and out of there. And when the students arrived, it was like uh, it, it was under good conditions on the first day of school, which was a, a very positive thing. I, I, I guess speak, we could entertain any questions relative I to that. A question, but I just mentioned a couple of things. Uh, as you see, uh, Hudson Associates, the architect, has already moved on to do the, the spec work for the, uh, the project at Achilles. Uh, we were able to put that underneath the same contract, again, working through Mr. Lindsay. And then if you notice the $19,510, this was an unexpected kick in the pants that occurred in May when the uh, the water pump went out to the big chiller system at the high school, and we were without air conditioning in the old section of the building, which includes A Hall, B Hall, C Hall, D Hall. I'm not, sorry, not D Hall, but uh, the commons cafeteria in the majority of the building. So, except for areas where we had smaller units going, and then D Hall, which is a newer place, uh, that impacted a large uh, portion of the building. But again, uh, we they, uh, Honeywell did a rush order on it for us and got it installed and back in operation actually probably in Ju late July, I believe. So, any questions? Uh, I don't see any hands. So, uh, go ahead and proceed. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Meyer. Uh, so, on page 74, I'm reading that bottom line correct. Is that correct? The bottom line, yes, or net balance? Yeah. That's, That's correct. correct. Okay. Since a lot of people here don't have access to, would you mind saying what that number is? $1,792,807.39. Which is a under expenditure. Okay. How big, pardon? That's an under expenditure. You spent that much less than was no. projected. No, no. We haven't spent that money. No. The, the uh, board voted to approve $5 million for uh, HVAC systems in the county <clears throat> with the priority being to Petsworth and then for capital improvements primarily. That's what we well, my next question. What happened to the one points? <laughs> Nothing, Nothing yet. Okay. Still, did this come under budget or we're still not talking about the HVAC systems? 
Um, you can ask a question. Go ahead. Speak up a little. It looks like you came under budget, but is that true or not? Yeah. I mean, with regard. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, if I can expand a little bit, you know, with the allocation, with the five million dollar allocation, this is detailing the expenses that we've incurred so far and the projects. So we did complete the Petsworth project, and then right below that, you'll see where we have uh, encumbered one hundred and fifty-four thousand dollars to begin the design work at the Achilles Elementary School. Now that is currently about 25, 35% complete. So that will be another project that will be funded out of the remaining $1.7 million. Replacement of approximately 21 incremental units that are like 1980s vintage. If I recall, when you made the presentation, there was like $20 million worth of capital projects with the priority being the Petsworth and the Achilles system. And That's the correct. idea was to <clears throat> appropriate money that would deal with the most pressing projects uh, with the fact that there are still other major capital needs. But these were this $5 million was essentially addressing the most pressing needs for those two schools. Absolutely. Mr. Hudson, did you have a comment, question? Well, this, I mean, we need to look at it two ways. One was the $5 million bond that we did for the AC and roofing at Petsworth and Achilles. The, for the capital improvement, where we gave them was the $750,000. And that was part of the CIP. To, so we're looking at two different pages, actually, because that's where you need to look. And part of that it still isn't funding. My next question is, being on the CIP, have you already, what are your big ticket items this year that you're thinking about to include in CIP, or your wish list for CIP, such like these in the 750? Uh, well, as Ms. Parker said, we can always do roof, but uh, one of our biggest projects we're really looking into is something that is happening called a uh, government restrictions regarding lighting. As uh, many of you know, T12 lighting is no longer being produced. And if you walk through our schools, most of our lighting is our T12 lights, uh, light bulbs. So with that, no replacements available. We, we need to, um, we are working toward creating a, an aggressive approach to how to handle that, how to address that. Um, we've been actually meeting with some lighting uh, companies to get an idea and technology and LED lighting has stepped up and the price has gone down some, so we're, we're evaluating our projects there. So that's one of the major things. You know some other things on here like uh, the bathrooms. We actually held off on Biotop to get, a, get an idea. There are only two bathrooms near the library that need to be redone. And, um, of course, a, a project that uh, Ms. Wright and Ms. Church have been strongly involved with is increasing of our security systems within the buildings. Uh, when we opened up Petsworth, well, let me just back up. We currently have uh, our, our swipe badge system, uh, security system at the high school. We added Achilles last year, so Achilles has done that, uh, is done now. And Petsworth, when we did Petsworth, we had it open through our uh, operating budget. We went ahead and did the internal wiring for that, uh, the, the infrastructure. So the next step in that, in that school would be to add the actual cameras and, and the swipe cards and uh, buzzers. And uh, again, as I said, Ms. Church and Ms. Wright made another application for a security grant, which they received last year uh, to about $70,000, and you can apply for up to 100. They haven't received notice yet, but we're hoping to receive more money and take it and add more schools. If you recall, and if I may say also thank you in, in the past for, for the appropriation that was made for the, the, the voice over IP phones. All our schools have those now. And I will say uh, for peace of mind, uh, that has been a, a real uh, significant impact to teachers to know they have phones in their room and they can get help anytime they need it. So I want to thank you all because appropriation I made several years ago, a couple years ago. Mr. Um, 
so what are, just to refresh my memory, what are we doing to Achilles and what are we, high, and what are we doing to the high school? We're doing a feasibility study on Achilles for $154,000 for what exactly? HVAC and some roof repair, mainly HVAC replacement. Redesign the HVAC system over the school, is that? You were, yeah, we're designing replacement HVAC. Okay. Designing it oh, and then replacing it. A portion, uh, 31, 21 units or 31? 21, 21 units. Okay. 21 they call P-tax or, you know, air, uh, motel units. And, and do we have an estimate as to what that total cost will be at the end of the day? Do we're we still very it? preliminary. Yeah, very preliminary. But I think it might be right around 800,000. And and you, do you still think you'll be within the 1.8 million that you have to spend for oh, both the high school and the Achilles? Well, we're, we're still debating and discussing and researching what we would do with the remaining funds after the Achilles project is completed. But we do have priorities at the high school. Okay. I think if I'm correct, the project for Petsworth was, was done well and done, I think, well within what you were anticipating for a budget for that, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, again, the, the two priority projects that were embedded in that uh, our request was Petsworth followed by Achilles. And then if we had money left over to go to the next step. Right. Yeah. And just, just, just for Mr. Bazzani's, uh Information the the high school item there that nineteen thousand was a, a pump that went down as Mr. Hutchins yes, said in in May, yeah. and that was strictly a replacement that they really had a manufacture right? Yeah, right that was a seventies version pump that wasn't available for any repair parts or anything like that couldn't just purchase it off the shelf it had to be reproduced yeah and one thing I'd like to add if possible um, and in talking to the board when I first got here too it was the board's desire to ensure that we did everything that we could to try to get all of our buildings to a point where they have those security and safety features um, so that we can keep all of our kids safe. And as um, Ms. Hutchinson said, we're in that process of trying to see if we're going to get awarded a grant <clears throat> in addition. But I know as we continue to move forward, whatever we can do to make sure that all of our buildings have those necessary things like the swipe cards and that, that whatever system that we need to give us the, the, the highest degree of safety is something that we still will keep on our radar to make sure that we, we implement. Zani, one more question here. One more question. Okay. Um, what kind of roof are we putting on the new, new middle school? Is it a metal roof? Uh, something that's going to last us for 50 or 60 years? Or A good portion of the new middle school will be metal, and there will be some low slope, what we call low slope roof, that will be a PVC membrane. So it's a combination of both. It becomes very expensive to put metal roof over an entire school because you have so many square foot. But if you, you can get a quarter inch per foot fall slope built into your structure, that's fairly easily maintained. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say uh, a couple more things, Mike. Uh, also, we're, um, just for, and full disclosure, as we approach it, the, the balance that may be left over, we have um, a, a water tower a chilling cooling system at Peasley, and it and it's possibly has some issues, so we may look at addressing that one also it's just it's, as a priority after the Achilles. So that be weighed with, again with the high school. And also, I, I want to again say thank you. We have uh, the tennis courts look great, and it wasn't two weeks after we finished, and uh, Parks and Rec ran a, a summer camp program there. And likewise, the uh, high school stadium track looks phenomenal. So if you get a chance to go out to the football game, take a look at it, uh, you'll be very proud of uh, what, what's there. It uh, looks great. So thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions on this item? Okay, if not, we'll go to the final item with the joint meeting, um, the open meeting. This is uh, joint meetings and budget schedule. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Bjork and I wanted to put this on the schedule because I think there we, we sense there, there was an interest in trying to have more than just two meetings a year. Uh, now, given uh, with the impending opening of Page Middle School and some of the budget issues that um, have been presented to us, that we have uh, not just two meetings, but especially uh, you know perhaps quarterly meetings. So we just want to—I mean—we put that on the schedule to see uh, what kind of uh, comments we might get from both boards. Not all at once, everyone, please. 
I, I think it's important that we, we, we look at having an additional meeting or two. Um, I know that Mr. Records and I discussed it, and for the life of me during the joint uh, for, during the agenda construction for this meeting, I couldn't remember the concern that we had during the budget time last year, and I hadn't had a chance to call him and try to, and he, he may remember, but we had discussions about how the budget comes to us, we do some work with it, and you guys adopt the budget, send it to us, and yet we're not even anywhere near ready to finalize ours. And somewhere in there, and I don't know exactly where yet, I would like to have another meeting so that we can sit down and, and go over more in depth what you guys need from us so that we can, we can handle all this stuff a little bit better. One of the things I could say, and I'll turn over to Mr. Records, uh, is that we have adjusted our schedule to some degree. So when we, <laughs> we will be able to submit um, the school board's recommended budget prior to Ms. Garten providing you with her budget at the first meeting in March. Usually what happens in the past years is she provides her budget to you at, the, at your March meeting and a week later we approve our and submit our recommended budget a week after hers. Now they're, they're aligned because there's obviously conversations going on there, but this time what we're trying to do this year, working with Dr. Clemens, is to is to align that better so that when when we, we'll submit ours, at the, we have a meeting set up at the end of February so that we could go over that and and review that um, the superintendent's recommended budget and then at that time support a school board's recommended budget and forward that to Ms. Garten in, in advance of your March meeting. So that better aligns that up. Uh, and I don't know if Mr. Records wants to add anything. Yeah, I, I think that you, um, you hit the nail on the head for sure as far as the change that I think we've decided on to try to make the process more efficiently. And then we were talking about, months ago talked about, you know, how do we make this budget process a more efficient and effective process? <clears throat> and that one change already by submitting the school board's budget versus a superintendent's budget to you all will help make it more efficient. But even the potential of, um, we talked about accelerating when the superintendent gives our budget to us. So we're trying to figure out, the school board's trying to figure out how to, how to make our process as efficient as possible. But one of the things that I think still jumps out, and I think this is what, what you were referencing, Mr. Crisco, was it seemed like an additional joint meeting together, because I think one of them's in, in uh, February. I don't have that. That's May. That's March, March, yeah. Okay, so March. And... Um, we submit our budget to you guys, and then you, like last year, y'all had uh, just an array of different people coming to visit you about their budgets, and we were kind of the first one a month prior to all those people, and whether, I wouldn't say we got forgotten about, but it would just be good to, to refresh in our memories and, and begin to have conversations about, you know, what questions and issues um, that you all may have with respect to what the budget that we've approved. So an additional joint meeting would be beneficial, um, I think, and, and help make a more efficient process because as Dr. Clements mentioned earlier, you know, we're going to have a comprehensive plan with targeted metrics, what we plan to do. And one of those things is it can also be a tool to use, a tool that can be used to adequately define what we're asking for in the budget. So, you know, there's, I think we have a lot of things going on that will improve this entire process, but I guess the first thing would be one more joint additional uh, meeting prior to adopting the budget. Right, Mr. Chris, go ahead. right, and I think that we could maybe accomplish that. I know that we always typically schedule a large amount of work sessions, try to get one of our works, budget work sessions set up so that they, these guys can come back and, and discuss their budget with us at, the, at that time, like Mr. Records was saying. When we brought in the different departments last year, you know, three or four at a time, maybe have one of those other budget work sessions set up so that we can have additional time with, with the school board folks. Okay, I really sense that there um, is a consensus to have that meeting. 
Um, so I would assume that when we start setting up our schedule for meetings uh, at the first of the year, that will include a uh, another joint session uh, that would uh, deal with the budget. Probably towards the end of April. Towards the yeah. Uh, well, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Ms. Parker. Um, I just want to uh, food for thought is maybe not have it necessarily on one of your work sessions so that we'd have a little more time to deal with the budget itself because I know you have restrictions on what that you have to have public comment and that kind of things on your work session night that maybe we could just pick another date that we were going to be able to just work on the things at hand with the budget and deal with those things without necessarily adding anything else to the agenda for that evening. Well, like I said, I think there's a consensus that we want another meeting that at this time, I don't think we have to fit, pick a specific date, but I think there's certainly the interest in having that. Um, and so I think when both boards begin the calendar year, we can begin to structure our meetings and which ones would be best served uh, to have both boards together. Okay, so any other questions on that? I don't see hands. We'll move on to uh, county administrator items, and uh, Ms. Garden is not here, and I see Nikki shaking her head, so she doesn't have anything. Um, matters presented by the board. Okay, I see no matters presented by the board. Um, okay, Mr. Wilmot, would you uh, call the... Oh, yes, sir. Didn't we add a topic item or two? Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to do the closed session first. We'll come back, allow the school board to adjourn, and then we'll add that last topic, which is just for the, uh, the Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> so they can go home about five minutes earlier. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Mr. Uh, Chairman, let me, that's me. May I, may I say something on behalf of, of the staff here? This is the last time we'll be working with Nikki in public. So we'd like to say thank you for all she's done for us over the over the years and just the partnerships that she's shared with us. And thank you, Nikki. So with that, Mr. Wilmot. Whereas the Gloucester County Board of Supervisors and the school board desire to discuss a a particular subject in closed meeting during the course of their joint meeting of September 16, 2014, and whereas the nature of the subject is discussion or consideration of the potential acquisition and or disposition of an interest in real property for a public purpose, the discussion of same and closed meeting is expressly permitted by Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A3. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Gloucester County Board of Supervisors and the School Board do hereby convene in closed meeting for the purpose herein expressed pursuant to the legal authority herein recited. So moved. Thank you. So moved. Okay. Um, Ms. Chairman, do we pull the board? Yes, sir. Mr. Bazzani? Yes. Mr. Crisco? Yes. Dr. Orth? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. <laughs> Mr. James? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Weinbarker? Yeah. School board members, you heard the recommendation. Do I have a motion? So moved. A second? <coughs> second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. Mr. Hutchinson, can you pull the board? I apologize. I got lost in this place, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, Mr. Birak? Yes. Ms. Hensley? Yes. Ms. Hook? Yes. Ms. Parker? Yes. Mr. Records? Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. Yes. continue their open meeting and now whereas we're live only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting were heard discussed or considered during the closed meeting and the only subjects heard discussed or considered in said closed meeting were the matter matters identified in the resolution by which it was convened now therefore be it resolved that the Gloucester County Board of Supervisors and the school board do hereby reconvene an open meeting at their joint meeting of September 16, 2014 and certify the matter set forth in Virginia Code Section 2.2-3712D. 
So move. So moves a second. Okay. Um, Ms. Champion, pull the board. Dr. Orth? Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Weinbarker? Yes. Mr. Bazzani? Yes. Thank you. School board members, you heard the motion. Do, do, we, do we have a motion on the floor? Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Hodgson, will you pull the board? Yes. Ms. Parker? Yes. Mr. Records? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Birak? Yes. Ms. Inslee? Yes. And Ms. Hook? Yes. Okay. One last thing. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn for the Cross County School Board? So moved. Second. Motions. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. To know that. Thank you, Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen. <laughs> Supervisor agenda is the discussion of a meeting to develop a strategic plan and <clears throat> uh, having a, a retreat. So, and uh, Mr. Morris sent out a little note to all of us. And would you want to just quickly summarize that, Mr. Meyer? Yes, I'll try to do it real quick here. Uh, the, the discussion on the strategic plan, I think, uh, was a little bit broader than what we really need. Uh, what I think we need, and as I expressed in the email, is we need to take a look at the comprehensive plan, each of us, and looking at the vision statements, if you will, as to where is the county trying to go in the long term. Each of us decide where that might need to be modified or adapted to the current situation. And then third, uh, we develop broad policy guidance statements based on the visions of our revised comprehensive plan. And those broad policy statements will help, one, the people understand where we're trying to go with the board, and two, help the uh, county employees understand where the board's going, what our intent is, and what we're hoping it looks like. I think this is more of a half-day session than a full-day session, which should ease the scheduling. It's a responsibility of us as the policy makers for the county to do this, and if uh, county employees are involved with it, then what you have is called a, uh, a vested interest in some outcome or another. So I think it's appropriate that uh, the retreat be limited to the Board of Supervisors, to the county administrator who acts as a subject matter expert, a corporate knowledge that uh, many of us don't have, she provides that, but the policy development is not part of her charter in that, and then a recorder. So be looking for scheduling those nine people for half a day session. I also would like to get a professional facilitator because I would like to facilitate this one, but I have a certain way I would like it to go, which may not coincide with how you would like it to go. So I'd like to get a professional facilitator to make sure that it's done properly. And I think from how the county goes forward, this could be a pretty important thing. I did contact a professional uh, facilitator who I've worked over a dozen times in the past with and I think is very good and nominally it's a thousand dollars for both the prep and a half-day session 
but I also hope that those of you who may know a professional facilitator, uh, and she's a Lean Six Sigma black belt instructor kind of person. If you know one, then I think it'd be wise if uh, you contacted them and we had a little bit of a uh, discussion as to who might be compete for it. It's kind of long-winded, so it's over to you all as to what do you think about that approach. Hey, gentlemen, um, some comments? Has anybody worked with facilitator before? Yes. Okay, so we all know what that is. That's, yeah, we, we, we know what they are. Okay. And I, th I think what we need to do. Uh, oh, you know, we don't have facilitators. We have hammers. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So what, what we need to decide upon, and I think there seems to be consensus that this is a pretty good uh, move by the board, and a half, se half day session would be would be uh, appropriate. Um, I know that the doodle poll went the, the doodle poll went out, and it was tough getting everyone together, but. What about having like a session where we meet for dinner <clears throat> and have an evening session, which would be like about half a day, so we can meet? What are you laughing at? I think we had a hard time getting everyone for a Saturday, even for a whole, for even for a half a day, and that's why I was thinking, uh, you know, the evening over di starting with dinner and going to uh, you know nine nine o'clock or something like that. What do you think, John? I think Morton's in Arlington is a good place. Uh, I don't know how it would look in the taxpayers' <laughs> part. Um, but uh, what about during the week? Is that appropriate for people to have it like on, a, uh, on an evening rather than a weekend? I've seen a lot of shaking heads. What if I get uh, Ms. Garden to do a doodle poll and have it so that we have uh, dinner involved and we can actually go through and, and discuss things? Um, even during dinner. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I personally don't know anyone in the region. Uh, the facilitators that I've been involved with have always come from uh, my work with, uh, you know, my, my profession. I know that um, I've spoken with a member of the school board at different times about uh, where he works, them using a facilitator. I'll be more than happy to contact him and see if he has any potential leads and get back with you all. Okay, that's great, but I think there's a consensus that we go with a facilitator. Ms. Weinbarger. Um, would we need the services of Mr. Wilmot in this meeting or not because we're going to talk about policies and I want to make sure if we do anything that it's legal Going to say, say what now? Are we going to Morton's? No, Chris, Chris? No. Oh, well, no. Try to be happy to attend. McDonald's. Uh, I still would be happy to attend. Uh, okay. No, I'm just I'm asking if, if you guys think that we should have him there for clarity or, or to to. Uh, you just decide that whenever, and if you let me know, and I'll be there if you want me there. Okay. Okay, well, let's include him in the doodle poll. Yeah, Mr. Abizani. Mr. Crisco, Miss, when, when you solicit your, you know, your contacts with a facilitator, you have to make sure that they have no, no interest or no knowledge of what we do here in Gloucester County. They have to be completely um, unbiased. In terms of timing, just so I get a general idea, are we thinking of like maybe sometime in October? Okay. I think it needs to be before January. I mean, I was going on, you know, looking at the Saturdays, and I said, the way it's playing together, it might have to be January. But if we're looking at a half a day dinner, I think it would be a good idea to have everything, well, not everything, but a good idea where we're headed before the start of the year. It's still a little late in the budget process, but it's not that late because they're turning it in December. But we're not looking at any drastic changes that would affect the budget this year. But we are looking at changes that's the long-term goal or long-term plans for the county. So I think if we could do it October, it would be great. I mean, my thought is we've already got Tuesdays pretty much booked up. Maybe look at a Tuesday or a Thursday. Okay. Well, let's do the doodle poll. 
see where we come from and uh, take it from there. But let's all try to shoot for October. The sooner the better. You know, and yeah, let's, let's, let's look for October. Uh, I think if you're in the first half of October, you may have trouble getting the facilitator up to speed once we determine the date. Let's, let's uh, if you would check, and then we'll just do the whole poll and then see where we can uh, end up with. Okay, gentlemen, anything else? Seems like we are uh, in con total consensus with that, and if I sense anything else, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, there's been a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. All those against? Ah. We adjourn. <laughs>